You're listening to Power Athlete Radio, a podcast dedicated to empowering your performance every damn day. Join former NFL pro and power athlete founder John Wellborn as he dissects the greatest minds in strength, conditioning, and more. So whether your goal is to be the hammer, destroy mediocrity, or simply move the dirt, you've come to the right place. Now with the warm-up done, let the gains begin. Hey, Power Athlete Nation. We have an excellent podcast in store for you today here in the Power Athlete Podcast Room at Power Athlete HQ with Mr. Steve Welch, who's co-founder and CEO of Restore, which uh, I'm fascinated for a number of reasons. Um, they are a kind of, they started here in Austin, but it's a global or, you know, uh, I guess you could say um, set of franchises across the U.S. I don't think they bridge outside the U.S. yet, but with 250 locations and it's a fascinating model. Um, it involves, you know, coming in, they have nurse practitioners and doctors, they do uh, blood work, they do IVs, they do a bunch of different of the recovery modalities from, you know, cryo to, uh, you know, Normatec boots and, you know, light beds. And they just have a ton of these different recovery modalities, but also working with people to be more fit versions of themselves, whether that involves, you know, some of the glut stuff with like Ozempic, uh, helping people with through blood work with, you know, micronutrients, but really just helping people be better versions of themselves. But even taking that a step further and, you know, seeing, uh, meeting Steve and, you know, who's local to me, but a uh, serial entrepreneur and has been very, very successful in his time as an entrepreneur in different markets. So um, more from the standpoint of like what he's created and what his team has put together and how they've managed it and developed the systems within the back end technology. I'm fascinated by that piece of the business and more importantly, how you build your business. I've always been kind of in this pioneer state where it's, you know, hey, I'm, you know, building a brand and progressing it, but those other different levels of, you know, taking it from one and then, you know, going to where they are, obviously with 250 locations and selling franchises and all the pieces that go with it. Uh, I'm in uh, extremely, you know, awe of people that can, you know, take an idea and get it that far along. So it was great to have him in the podcast and just hear his take on not only on business, but on technology and family and how he kind of balances the buckets of, you know, himself personally, his business and his family is, is fascinating. So I was, um, extremely excited to, you know, make his acquaintance, have him on the podcast and, you know, call him a friend. So Mr. Steve Welch, buckle up. Hey, welcome to another episode of Power Athlete Radio. I'm joined today by Mr. Steve Welch, CEO and co-founder of Restore. Thanks for having me, John. Yeah, thanks for coming. This is awesome. Uh, one, I'm excited because you have a cool business that's local uh, to Austin. I believe it started here. Yeah, absolutely. And, Austin yeah. based. And then, then it's since grown. And, you know, restoration and what people are doing uh, feels like such a hot deal. I mean, I saw the other day on some deal that... Uh, I think it was cold plunge or plunge deal did a um, the cold tubs uh -huh. um, reported a hundred million yeah that they had done so which is roughly like fifteen thousand units were sold at you know anywhere from six to eight thousand yeah which when I saw that number I almost like passed out <laughs> that there's fifteen thousand cold plunges out there and there's that many people willing to spend that money for yeah. something that as max you're maybe in three minutes a day yeah well I mean I think that's a really good indication of where the consumer is today. You know, in, in this country, um, we've trained people to invest in their education. Nobody will question that. It's the right thing to do. We've trained people to invest in their retirement. We've trained people to invest um, in, in a lot of things. We've never really trained them to invest in their health. In fact, that's kind of a new concept. I mean, we should. The most valuable thing we all possess is our health. And the reality is we're kind of the system has been set up to, yeah, hey, well, I'll wait until I'm sick and then I'll take care of it. And in this country, we have an amazing medical system once you're sick. Yeah. We've or if you terrible. get shot <laughs> or if you get in a car wreck. Right. I mean, I, I think for acute issues, our medical is, is as good as, right. as it gets. But managed care with chronic stuff, we've kind of failed that. Pretty terrible. Pretty terrible. And, you know, if I'm a healthy 40-year-old, you know, the healthcare system doesn't really care about me. And the reality is the decisions I make when I'm 40 are going to have an amazing impact on what life is like when I'm 70. And I think, again, the consumers figured that out. You know, you know, my, my previous company was a company called, and I still own, is Dream It. And at Dream It, we do tons of work with Boston Consulting, McKinsey, on kind of where healthcare is going. And if you go back and you look at the data, 20 years ago, when you asked, asked open-end questions about health, you got three things. You got doctor, pharmaceutical, hospital. About a decade ago, the consumer started to put other things there, like nutrition, 
and exercise and preventative medicine. It was, it, it was clear even a decade ago the consumer was just going in a different direction than the healthcare system was going. And Restore was really born out of that. It was born out of this understanding that the consumer um, was looking for ways to, to invest in their health and, and to address these things while they're healthy. And you know that's how that's why I think we've been so successful. We have you know we're 230 plus locations, 40 states, and it's because we have a the, the what we offer is what the consumer is looking for. What do you think uh, caused that pivot in the market? Um, I think it's been. Does it mirror Facebook? No, no. I actually, I, I actually think no. I think it, it it started well before that. I think this is a little bit different than the child epide- or epi- epidemic on um, on that's caused by social media. Uh, I think this is really more. We've now all seen our parents' age and grandparents' age, you know, um, and and we've seen them, and we've seen the decisions they made when they were younger and how they affected them. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, almost every person kid I know can actually talks when they talk about their parents. They'll talk about in both good and bad. They'll talk about, hey, my you know my dad is super healthy and here are the things he did, or you know my mom is unhealthy and here are the things she did. She smoked for twenty years, and I think we're just the first generation that has grown up to think about that. And because we've seen that, we're more conscious of our decisions today than, than our previous generations were. And that's why we're making those decisions today. And that's why 15,000 people buy uh, cold plunge. That's why we have over 50,000 members across the country. People are people are gonna invest. And by the way, of all the things to invest in, I would argue that probably the most important thing people should invest in is their health. Yeah, wow. No, I, um, uh, I was looking at some pictures recently of my grandparents and Honestly, I think they were probably in their 50s or 60s in the pictures, and they might as well have been 400 years old. <laughs> like blue hair, this polyester, driving a you know brown Chevy Citation polyester pants, mm-hmm. like sitting around in this living room that was like plaid and paisley. And I, I like I looked at the date and I kind of worked backwards. I'm like, they were only in their 50s and they were retired. Yeah. And now you meet people in their 50s and you know they're pretty fit and they're young and they're still actively working and they're trying to do this. It was uh, this idea where you, you know, 50 was kind of the expiration and maybe you make it to 70 and you have 20 years to retire. Yeah. And I, like, I couldn't believe looking at them and being like, they're in their fifties. Like yeah. I'm almost 50, yeah. you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm believe I'm closer to 50 than I am to 40. And I like, there's no idea of retirement or this. And like, they just did just looked old. Yeah. And I think that's the one thing. And I, that's why I asked about Facebook and social media where now it's kind of, you're starting to track these trends over time. Cause there's something more than just a family photo album. Yeah. And I'm wondering if like part of it has to go with, uh, I don't want to feel old. I want to continue to stay young. I still want to be able to go do things. And there's different avenues. Like it looks like training and nutrition and sleep. And now with so much more information available to us, I mean, when we went to school, I actually had to go to the library. Yeah. And go check out the microfish and you know the books and go through it. And now it's like the entire world, like is at the palm of my hands. Right. I, like when my kids come to me and they're like, "Hey, can you help me with this?" I'm like, "I can't even believe you're asking for help with as much access as you have to information." Yeah. We interrupt this episode with a shameless self promotion. Power Athlete delivers battle tested performance programming for every kind of athlete. So, do you want to go from average Joe to MVP? Then dominate with Field Strong. Get stacked and jacked with Jack Street. Hustle in life and still build muscle with Grindstone. Fear no opponent with Dragon Slayer. Be harder than coffin nails with Hammer. Max out minimal equipment with Lean Enable. Or unlock those newbie gains with Bedrock. Get over to powerathletehq.com forward slash training and choose your seven day free trial right here, right now. Get lifting, get training, get in shape, all while listening to the rest of this show. No, it, it's a different world for sure. And I, I think the the consumer, again, the average person out there, um, the fact that they have that information accessible to them is, is partially driving some of this. You know, we um, we focus as a company, we focus on education. You know, there's there's a lot of companies out there. Um, you know, every company has to have their own voice. Our voice is to be truth tellers and to, to focus on education. And, and some of that is we will tell you when there's an absence of uh, evidence. I mean, there's some of the things that are in healthcare. I mean, let's be real. There's a lot of bullshit out there. Yeah. In fact, I get I get an email a week from a company with a new globe with a magnetic sphere that you know changes your mood. Um, and, and there's again a lot of bullshit. There's also a lot of good stuff that there's still not the evidence whether it works or not. And I think what we've done incredibly well as a brand is to bring that to light and say, here, here's what what we're doing. Here's why we're doing it, and here's why we you know we're comfortable that it it's going to benefit the consumer and the, and the uh, client in the long run. And here are the clinical studies we're doing to back that up over time. 
So take me through the the process. Obviously, mm-hmm. somebody you know hears about it, they see it on social media, a friend talk about it, they drive by and they see it, and they, they walk in the front door. What, what is the process and what's available to them? Yeah, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to try to understand why you're there. Um, you know, I think great companies understand their customers and their clients. Um, so our, our process starts with simply understanding, John, what are you trying to accomplish? Why? What's what matters to you? Is it you know maybe it's your lower back pain and you're trying to get rid of that, or maybe it's you're trying to set a personal record in the hundred meter dash. Um, but understanding why you're there and then trying to understand how we can build a plan for you to reach that goal. Mm-hmm. I think that's one of the reasons our you know we have we're a franchise system. Our good franchise operators are just exceptional at understanding their clients and building a path for them to meet those individual goals. And and just for clarity. It is not just in restore. There, you know, I don't care if you came to restore every day, but you ate shitty your whole life. You know, there's limits of what's going to happen. And um, if you came to restore and did everything perfect, uh, but yet you never left your couch, you know, you're not going to achieve your goals. So it is a holistic way of thinking about health. Um, we are certainly a part of it, and a big part of it, but it exists well beyond the four walls of our studios. And and we got to make sure our clients understand that if they want to really meet their their goals long term. Uh, what what's your standard demographic? Um, is it you know men women equal split? We're we're roughly equal thirty five to fifty five. Um, what's I mean it's a pretty wide spectrum. What, what's interesting is, you know, here's the reality: we all physically and mentally peak at about thirty, okay, plus or minus based on life decisions. I don't know a single person. I'm in my forties now, probably similar age as you. Um, I don't know a single person over forty that can't point to a, a point in time where they said, "Man, I just remember having more energy than I do now," or mm. "I didn't. I don't remember having these aches and pains." And it is when that starts to happen that I think they're they start to search out a restore. Mm. Um, I think that's number one. Number two is if they've seen they've either had a life event. Um, you know, some of our, our unfortunately some of our clients that are the the. The, the most passionate are those that had a heart attack or had a stroke, had you know, it came down with a chronic disease, now have diabetes, um, and and I think they become more active at that point, um, or they've seen that happen to their parents. I think that is that opens up people's eyes when all of a sudden, you know, I'm, I'm the first to admit, you know, my parents very both very healthy. They're now both 77, 78, and uh, about 70. My father, who looked amazing, like you would have looked at this guy, and he lived in. A, you know, he played tennis seven days a week. He was in the seniors tour uh, on paper. Everything looked great. He had emergency five bypass surgeries and it came out of total nowhere. Now, he did a lot right. You know what he did? Terrible. He ate like shit his entire career. He, he had Dr. Pep, five Dr. Peppers a day, ate McDonald's all the time. That, you know, that was, I was roughly 40 and uh, that was a life changing event for me. And that, that definitely had that not happened. I'd still would be healthy, but I think I'd have a different diet than I have now. And I think that, you know, we learn from those around us if we're smart. You know? Yeah. Well, they say, uh, uh, when, what was the the quote my dad used to tell me? Uh, a wise man can learn from his own mistakes and the mistakes of others. Yeah. You're a fool if you have to make every mistake yourself. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he repeated that to me. You know, he since passed away, but uh, I that echoes in my head constantly. Yeah. Like, don't be an idiot. You don't yeah. have to make every mistake. There's a, there's a similar one. I'll probably screw up here, but uh, uh, if you don't learn from the past, you're always a child. Yeah. yeah. And and I don't remember where that where that came from, but you know, um, you know, here's the advantage of the world. You know, we have other people to learn from. And now to your point, we have more information than we've ever had. The question is, can we use that? And I think that's hopefully people use it wisely. So do you work with, um, I don't know, like uh, healthcare practitioners or doctors to kind of f- help formulate a, a plan for these individuals? Oh, absolutely. We have a, uh, I think we have about a dozen doctors. We have, I think, over 50 nurse practitioners uh, spread around the country. Um, and they put together, hey, here are different healthcare plans based on people's needs and desires and what they're trying to accomplish. Um, and I think we've done, again, a really good job of pr- understanding, again, there's a several parts of this equation. What are you trying to accomplish? But how much time you can commit? Mm-hmm. How much money you commit? I mean, those, all those variables really matter to, to hitting your goals. And I think um, we've done a really nice job um, throughout the system of putting together. You know, here's here's what can work for you based on you know your time commitment. You can really dedicate to this. Um, and everybody's different. You know, I think this is the other area that the consumer started to go a different way than the healthcare system. The consumer realized way before the healthcare system, that everybody's an individual. Yeah. Everybody has different needs. Everybody is genetically very different. And this idea of kind of one fi- size fits all just doesn't work. And while the healthcare system was going down that way, the, the average person was saying, well, that doesn't work for me. And I think that's why you have a real disconnect and a frustration with the average American and with the traditional healthcare system. Yeah, well, I mean, we've been taught for the last 50, 60 years, this food pyramid that we know <laughs> <laughs> like doesn't lead us where we need to go. Yeah. And, uh, you know, even when I was at Berkeley, I remember I, I uh, 
uh, took a bunch of nutrition classes and wanted to go that direction. And I remember even what I was taught in those, you know, considered a cutting edge school for nutrition. Um, I ended up, uh, when I got to the NFL, um, there's a guy named Dr. Mauro De Pasquale who wrote a book called The Anabolic Diet. And he uh-huh. was a big kind of like paleo, you know, uh, high protein, higher fat guy. Yeah. And, um, you know, so I, I got sponsored by a supplement company, said, hey, I want to do your diet. So he provides me this diet. And I'm like, look how high this is in protein. I'm going to have, uh, you know, kidney failure. Look how <laughs> high this is in fat. I'm going to have, you know, high cholesterol and die of a heart attack. Yeah. And he was like, those are all myths. Yeah. And I had to take a leap of faith. And all of a sudden, within like, you know, three months, uh, the body, like the recomposition and the performance just skyrocketed through the nice. roof. And I realized, I was like, oh man, we've been, we've been sold a bill of goods yeah. that is not accurate. And more importantly, is leading people down into a road of sickness and health and really just a lack of flexibility going through life. This episode of Power Athlete Radio is powered by Train Heroic, the most immersive strength training app experience on the market. We've built an online training business by partnering with Train Heroic to deliver all of our world-class training programs like Jack Street, Hammer, Field Strong, and Grindstone. To learn which Power Athlete training program best suits your goals, head to powerathletehq.com training. And if you're a coach looking to build a business with the best training tech in the business, head to trainheroic.com slash powerathletehq. And now back to the show. A little bit of humbleness, I think, will do as well as a society. Um, we have a lot of unanswered, unanswered questions. Um, I think it's going to take time to, for those things to play out. I think the advantage is today, the data set is you know is just there in a way it wasn't before, um, and I think data is destiny. I think the, those that are able to figure out how to use that information um, in a way that's helpful for their individual clients, again, data is going to be different. If you're a you know thirteen year old. Chinese girl, you're going to have a lot of things different about you than if you're a 55 year old, you know, English male. Um, and I think, you know, you know, I have a company that my portfolio called Echo and they, uh, their, their original tagline was the Shazam of heartbeats. So if you remember Shazam, you can mm-hmm. put it up and you hear us now. So, um, they have, and I, I don't know the numbers, hundreds of thousands of recordings of actual individual hearts. And they're using AI now to, to look at that and they can hear things. There's no human in this planet would ever be able to hear. And, you know, so running those recordings of the human heart, they're able to diagnose stuff way in advance, way more accurately than the human body or human mind could do, or any doctor could. And I think that's what's so exciting when you look at what's coming down the pipeline. It is technology coupled with data to allow us to personalize and understand. Again, everybody's different. It's going to require us looking at everybody as an individual and building a plan for them uh, based on that. And I think that's that's what's exciting to me is that the technology that's coming is really going to change the health in this country. How did you get into this? I mean, we've you know you've already talked about three different companies that you've been involved in. Like, what was the the precipitous for you know starting this and really going in this direction? I mean, was it something you got into later, or you just had this epiphany, this idea, or? Yeah, so, so my background, I'm a, I'm a geeky engineer by training. Um, started a company when I was pretty young called Mitos. Um, we built the, the back-end sims, systems that were used to manufacture vaccines, biological drugs. 23 years old, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I didn't know what a venture capitalist was. Certainly didn't know what an angel investor was, so I, I bootstrapped that. They don't know it, but uh, Merck and Amgen basically paid the bills, got them to pay money up front, and then used that to, to build a business. Um, sold that when I was 30 to Parker. Um, 30 is a little too young to kind of goof off and surf and, you know, for the rest of your life. Um, so got together with a couple other entrepreneurs that had some big exits. And we started a company called Dream It. And the idea behind Dream It was to give entrepreneurs a small amount of money, a lot of focus in a short period of time to try to force the idea, candidly, to fail, but fail capitally efficiently. You know, failing is fine as long as you fail quickly and without spending a ton of money. But the worst thing to do is, you know, spend tens of millions of dollars and ten you know, decades to fail. So, uh, we started that candidly for altruistic reasons. Uh, however, the capitalists and us took over a little bit as we got about two years in. We realized you know, we were taking equity in these companies and we were getting some pretty amazing results. So through that that company, we actually became the second most active healthcare investor in the country. And I, it's got to caveat that with number of deals um, because we were writing small checks. We were writing fifty to five hundred thousand dollars checks you know, sure. versus you know you have private equity funds now write billion dollar checks. Sure. So, um, but in that we kind of we. we we really had a good vision of where healthcare was going. You know, the reality is when you see, you know, when we'd see a bunch of crazy ideas, they would seem crazy to us. Um, that was usually a pretty good indicator that, you know, people tend to be early entrepreneurs by their nature, see the world ahead of where it's going. So, you know, if you see one crazy idea, yeah, it's probably doesn't mean anything. That's just, you know, but when all of a sudden you start seeing two or three similar, that's a really good signal that something's, something's going to happen there. And um, it, it, it you know, dream it, we were seeing a clear 
change of focus to on direct to consumer. The, the, you know, selling the building devices, things that the consumer would use totally outside the payer, traditional payer provider system. So Restore was really born out of that. My, my partner, Jim Donnelly, who was the heart and soul of this business, started doing cryotherapy. Um, I started making fun of him for doing cryotherapy. To me, the time it sounded like absolute snake oil. Um, we were training for a triathlon at the time and he, he finally got me, he got sick of me making fun of him. So he, he finally paid for me to go do it you know, cryotherapy at this place. I went into this place, it was here in Austin. It was just weird. Um, like I got into a room, I took off my clothes. They told me to click on my clothes. You're putting on like uh, oven Glo mitts. Oven mitts. I get into this chamber. Then I tell the person I'm in the chamber and they can come in because I've used the, yeah. so it, it, the whole experience was just terrible. However, I'd done a 35 mile bike ride here in the hill country and you can't see this, but I had these little chicken legs. You know, I, I was not made, meant to be a biker. And, uh, Woke up the next day. Normally, I'd, I my legs would be jello after that bike. I woke up the next day, totally fine. Like, mm -hmm. all right, that, get, that gets my attention. And then, uh, you know, we did a bunch of A-B testing. We built out one location. Um, Jim had been a very successful entrepreneur as well. Um, and, uh, you know, we built out, I guess, a two, one. And then we built out another four A-B testing, a lot of different products and services and kind of ways to connect with the consumer. And then that's how really how I got started. It was this understanding. Cryotherapy itself was was interesting, but it was, hey, there needed to be a different way of thinking about health for the consumer, going direct to the consumer, providing them the ability to, to start addressing these things while they're healthy, not no, we don't want, not once they're in the hospital and sick. I mean, the reality is a lot of what we do Every hospital in this country has hyperbaric chamber. You know, yep. we have hyperbaric chambers. Every hospital in this country obviously does, you know, IVs left and right and IM sure. shots, all these things. It wasn't, you know, we didn't invent new therapies. We took existing therapies and, and brought them and put them into a package that made them way more accessible, way more fun, way more transparent. And we built a system on that top of that allows them to be personalized for the actual individual need. Uh, there are very few things I've come across that are as beneficial as hyperbarics. I agree so with that. Completely. We had uh, Dr. Joe DeRudy, who was the mm -hmm. Navy's expert on, and um, I was completely blown away. One, that I didn't understand this technology, and two, that I was having to hear this. So then I went through his protocol, which was, I think, five days a week, 40 sessions, eight weeks. Gotcha. Uh, went and, um, down hard chamber. You know, It was 15 minutes down, 60 minutes on the bottom, 15 up. So I did okay. that for yeah. 40 sessions, which yeah. was a hell of a commitment. It was all January and December, and yeah. somewhere around 20 sessions – uh, it was uh, an incredible feeling. Yeah. And then I didn't necessarily notice anything from 21 to 40, but yeah. I just, you know, continued to do it because that was the protocol. And yeah. I remember calling him back and he's like, I felt great at 20. How many more do I have to do? And he's like, well, we don't have enough research to be able to tell anybody this stuff. But, yeah. There was one set of research done by the Navy and these are the protocols. Yeah. And then he sent me all the research and like, you know, the idea when you go down to two point or two atmospheres, now the body doesn't need hemoglobin to move mm -hmm. oxygen. So it absorbs into plasma and can oxygenate yeah. parts of the body. I mean, the effects in terms of like neurological efficiency, especially for something like playing pro football, yeah, where you know you're taking all this kind of chronic abuse to the head, yeah. I mean, you know, as people are doing this with two hyperbaric chamber sessions a week, you can like continue to rise, yeah. So, I mean, lo looking at this, I was kind of mad. I was like, dude, as a current NFL, or if I was still a current NFL player, I would have one of these units in yeah. my house, yeah, and I would be in it every single day, yeah. I mean, and, uh, you know, and there's a certain cost prohibitive nature of it, but you know, if, if it's a 140,000 and you're making millions, it looks like pennies on the dollar. Yeah. No, and, and that, you're hundred percent right. And that, you know, if you look at a lot of what we do, the, the elite athletes today have them in their homes, but the reality is what we're trying to do is make sure you don't have to be an elite athlete to have access to these things and, and to bring the costs in, you know, bring the costs down so they're way more accessible. Would you say the bulk of the business is the IV kind of piece? No, uh, cryotherapy is the largest. It's the biggest one. Yeah, and, and I think what, what's unique about cryo, have you, have you done cryotherapy? I know you've done cold uh, plunge. but Yeah, well, um, I got in a cold plunge, or I got in cold water almost every single day yeah. growing up in Southern California okay. going to the beach. Okay. And then when I played in the NFL in college, we always got in cold tubs. I mean, so it wasn't, it's pretty interesting that it's this revolutionary to people. Yeah. So when I meet people that talk about uh, cold plunging has yeah. changed their lives, yeah. I have no frame of reference because I'm like, dude, if you're getting in cold water for three minutes a day is is like the catalyst for you to change yeah. your life we have huge fucking problems yeah. and so uh, I, I went and i did a bunch of cryo stuff i never really noticed an effect from it okay so i mean we you know we did a post-workout did yeah. a pre-workout tried it yeah. a million different ways i yeah. just never really noticed but i also wonder if i'm cold adapted because i have no shiver response hmm. so when i get out of the like, like the cold tub or yeah. even when it's super cold here and i get in my pool when i get out i stand in the wind and i can't yeah. shiver 
So the doctor was like, either you're emotionally broken or something else, or you're so cold adapted. But yeah. uh, people have had great results with it. I just personally, yeah. it didn't seem to move the needle for me. Well, again, what everybody's got their own, everybody's unique and yeah. has their own own, uh, own needs. And and um, so, yeah, so for us, that is the, the biggest volume driver for sure. Um, and it's the stickiest, you know, because yeah, I, I don't do it every day, but I have a lower back every now and then I'll tweak. And it is amazing how it solves that problem for me. Um, oh. And I, I go do it, uh, go to do it, you know, a couple of days in a row, and all of a sudden, you know, pain that's clearly caused by swelling in my lower back um, goes away. So that is, yeah, that is the one that I think really changes. You know, probably people feel it the difference right away, and and because of that, it's very sticky. And you have a lot of people have chronic pain from everything from rheumatoid arthritis to fibromyalgia. Those people, you know, they have the options they have, or you know, they can be on a lot of these drugs that are very expensive. I think there's growing understanding that being on a lot of these drugs, especially large molecule, um, will have an impact on your liver and kidneys. Well, unknown what impact, but certainly no, nobody's sitting there saying there's gonna be no impact. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think they're often looking for alternatives that are, that use the body's natural defenses. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, a lot of the things we really try to strive for at, at, at Restore is, using the body's natural defenses, things that are already there, systems that have worked for millions of years of evolution. You know, cold therapy is not some unique thing that we developed or, no. you know, <laughs> you know the, the first known texts of man, you know, 3,000 years, sorry, 5,000 years ago, actually described cold therapy. Hippocratic School of Medicine, he had a section that talked about cold therapy. These are not, you know, new revelations that we've had. It clearly, clearly works. Cold therapy works, there's no question about well, it. Well, I mean, there's uh, the practice in like the, the Nordic countries mm -hmm. for putting the children outside. Yeah. You know, and letting them sleep outside one. in the cold. Oh, I don't know this one. Yeah. So if you look that up, there's like a, you know, Sweden or whatever, like when the kids are little, like in the strollers, they would put the, the babies outside. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, they felt that the cold weather and strengthened their immune system. Okay. You know, same thing when we were growing up. My, my mom's from Canada. Yeah. Uh, the idea of during the winter, you sleep with the window open, makes your blood thick and makes you more durable. In America, I think we call that child abuse. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's well, there, there's a lot of stuff today that uh, when I tell my kids, they're like, I can't believe you guys did that. Yeah. So it's just culturally very I, different. I'm a free range parent. I, what my wife and I keep waiting for the uh, police to show up because, <laughs> you know, our kids run around the neighborhood and we think that's fine, but that's no longer the acceptable these days. Yeah. Uh, so, so what are the catalog of services? I mean, obviously we talked about IVs, mm -hmm. um, uh, cryotherapy. Yeah. So, uh, uh, IV, um, uh, I am shots, uh, you know, and again, we, what we try to get away from just for clarity is like it, you know, there's a lot of places that offer individual services, the clinical work that we're doing today. And we actually just had a recent uh, publication with, you know, research we did with Texas A&M is looking at these things in combination. Mm -hmm. So I, I think this idea of looking at one therapy and how it affects you. And, and by the way, I think that's important research. Don't get wrong. I think the bigger question is when you start really taking a holistic approach, how do you get impact? I know we have Dr. Rachel Pajobic. Uh, who's our um, uh, head of science and, and uh, research. She's, you know, she is thinking through not just what are the therapies, but how we combine these together for the consumer. So yeah, it's cryotherapy, cold, which is cold therapy, uh, saunas, which is heat, um, I am shots, which is really obviously not the, you know, uh, micronutrients, um, I, uh, uh, IVs, which are micronutrients and, and uh, hydration, um, photobiomodulation, uh, compression therapy, um, and uh, and then we do a number of things in the skin health area, and the skin health we we do think skin is the largest organ in the body. Sure, um, we do think it's important to take care of that. You we now know a lot more when you have problems with your skin that affects other parts of your immune system entirely. So we have a number of areas there that we're focused on there that that we're you know, uh, everything from what's called a hydrofacial, which is putting peptides basically um, in the skin as part of a process. Um, so so those are the types of things we have there. But really for us, we start with why are you there? Mm -hmm. Why are you there? Let's understand what, what that is and let's work with you to build a plan to achieve that. Does that initial step take uh, like blood testing, for example? Often it does. Um, in an ideal world, always. Yeah. Um, but blood testing is expensive and not everybody can 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 do that. But no, uh, 100%. I get blood testing twice a year. Yeah, me too. Um, yeah, every six months. Yeah. And, and it's the cheapest insurance. Yeah. People might bitch about the price, but yeah. I'm like, believe me, um, it's one spot in time. Yeah. But when you look at that over 20 years, I mean, I started getting my blood work done twice a year when I was 23. Yeah. So I have 25, you know, 24, 22 years, whatever it is, uh, of every six months blood work. I think the only time I didn't was during COVID just because it somehow we missed that year. Yeah. Uh, but like for the most part, and then, you know, I go see the same doc, yeah. he pulls it up and he's got a program where he can kind of see these trends yeah. over time. And it's like, you know, this is where it's always been where, yeah. you know, and so, you know, 
like uh and then from there all of my blood work um goes back into micronutrients and then supplements that's where i'm like hey this is what i'm deficient in instead of just doing what i call the bro approach for supplementation which is hey bro this is what i took yeah which i've never been a huge fan of i'm like if you're gonna like take supplements and more importantly spend money on ibs and myers cocktails and nad and all these things at least figure out if this is something that you could potentially um, benefit from when i was 39 i was deficient in four things I'm 47. I'm not deficient in anything. Um, and it's because I've taken the supplements. I've, I've added it. Back what were you then. deficient in? Uh, iron. Zinc, magnesium, iron, and selenium? No. Uh, z- uh, iron, D. Um, I forget the other two, to be honest with you. Yeah. So, but iron and, and iron and D. And iron I take as a supplement. D I take as an IM shot. Sure. Um, and my, my cholesterol is lower, um, but through mainly change of diet for sure but i also get coq10 shots you know twice a month um and i have that all in you know excel spreadsheet you know and, and i will shocker tell you, yeah shocker that's right so <laughs> yeah, um, the, I, the engineer doesn't have it all well <laughs> i'm sure you even have google alerts set up for you to go get it done uh, i well that's a good one i should but i uh you know i think what you'll see over time at restores will bring that data to life for you so you know we are capturing that yeah we have a partnership with aura ring i don't mm-hmm. know if you're familiar yeah. with aura we think no uh, um um harpreet uh, their CEO. Uh-huh. Uh, I think he's been on the podcast. Oh, I'm like 99% yeah. sure. Yeah. We've done like 800 of these things. Okay. So sometimes it takes me a second to remember. I'm like, no, we talked to that guy. Yeah. No, it's, uh, I, by the way, I've listened to a lot. I haven't, I certainly haven't listened to 800. So I've, <laughs> I've missed a couple. Well, we, don't worry. When they started, we were fucking awful. Okay. It was uh, four dudes huddled around a mic, like <laughs> a phone call with like a guy and a speaker, you know, because when podcast started, yeah. it was, uh, you know, just purely audio. Yeah. And we hadn't figured that piece out. And then yeah. all of a sudden, Joe Rogan came out with a studio. And yeah. next thing you know, everybody's got to have a studio and YouTube. And so yeah. this thing has grown tremendously. All right. Well, I've definitely in the last couple of years, the quality has been great. So, so oh. I, I, now I, now you have encouraged me to go back and listen to some of the old ones just to see, it's important to see where you were. To, you know, to oh, see they were the so prudence. bad. So when we were in Newport beach, um, I had, uh, uh, like we were in this kind of light industrial park for power athlete and we had you know, offices and then there was a gym in the back where we did all of our filming. We still yeah. trained yeah. and it felt like every single time we had a podcast, uh, booked, they, the, t- uh, trash trucks would come and it'd be like, <laughs> beep, 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 <laughs> when they like pick up the big things and we would sit here and be like dude this is crazy yeah like they've already come twice this week how are they here already and it just was like the ongoing joke of like us sitting there waiting for the trash trucks to come over and then we'd always be like hold on we'll edit this out just take a second we gotta wait for the trash trucks yeah Yeah. (laughs) so how did you end up in in texas like you're the californian texan so uh yeah i mean it's a kind of a uh not a unique story i mean we (laughs) I came pre Joe Rogan, okay. so I kind of break everybody. Joe uh, followed you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 100%. Yeah, it was us. Yeah. Uh, but when I meet people, especially from California, I always ask, are they pre and post Joe Rogan? And the majority are post Joe Rogan. Yeah. And, you know, also pandemic. I was going to say, I think that's more pandemic. Yeah. It, yeah. Pandemic was crazy down here. For well, those that were in Austin, Texas, for those that don't know, it's crazy. So uh, in 99, my agent was went to UT uh-huh. and he lived here in Bee Cave. Okay. And so he tried to get me to buy 40 acres next to him, okay. which was uh, before Spanish. Spanish Oaks. Uh-huh. He sold his property so they could build Spanish Oaks. Yeah. So he did pretty well. Yeah. And that 40 acres now is probably worth about 80 million. <laughs> and so like where you're at the HEB, if you look over, you see that hillside, yeah. that's where it was. Okay. So we came out here in 99 yeah. and there was nothing between his house. They had just built that HEB yeah. on uh, 71. There was nothing between his house and like Hamilton pool. Okay. Cause we went to Hamilton yeah. pools. There was nothing. Yeah. So, uh, I, you know, didn't buy the land. Cause I remember I told my dad and he's like, what do you want to live in Texas? We're going to have like a cowboy hat. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. So I ended up not buying it. Um, but, uh, we are it, doing this in a barn. It's important. Yeah. To know. Okay. <laughs> it looks a lot nicer than, but it's actually a really nice barn. It is a nice, barn. this is uh, uh barn pros from Olympia, Washington. So when yeah. I came and looked at this thing, I was like, man, this is a really expensive barn. Yeah. It's got his own septic. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's the, the guy that built this, this place didn't cheap out on yeah. anything. Um, but we were doing a bunch of military contracting and just a lot of work and it necessitated a move out of California. Yeah. And I told my wife, I'm like, you know, we were looking at different places and I was like, let me take you out to this little town I almost lived in, in Texas. Yeah. So we flew out to Austin and we drove out here and she was like, man, this is great. Now I was driving around completely like floored cause I hadn't been here in 20 years or 15 years, whatever yeah. it was. And I was like, holy shit, like this, this really kind of grew up <laughs> and, you know, it was still kind of like enough rural where I felt like we were out of town and in the country a little bit. Yeah. So we found this place 
and um, it had been you know vacant for over a year. The owner had passed away, yeah. And uh, it just sat in you know they'd shown it seventy times, and I came out and looked at it, and I like I didn't even look at the house. I just walked the property, and yeah. I came back, and the guy who was selling the home was like, you know, I've shown this place seventy times, and not a single person's ever walked the property. So I made an offer on the spot, and we ended yeah. up uh, moving out here. I mean, we were we obviously sold our house, yeah, rented, and came out here, and we've been out here ever since. So how did you make the transition? Yeah, so you know I was in Philadelphia when you were at the yeah. Eagles. Um, you know, not all athletes can make the transition to from an athletic career to a post athletic career that's successful. How do you make that transition? Uh, that was kind of interesting. Um, obviously, I you know finished up in Philly, or I, I was in Philly, got traded to go play for the Chiefs. My contract ended there, and I went to go play for uh, the Patriots. Yeah, ended up getting hurt in the last preseason game. Came home, had knee surgery. And while I was chilling on the couch, um, my knee was in a CPM. I got reached out by this little fitness company at the time called CrossFit. Mm -hmm. And their CEO called me on the phone and asked me if I would help them develop their technology on how to train athletes. Yeah. And uh, the only reason that that had kind of come about was I was living in Newport Beach and I got tired of driving to Carson uh -huh. uh, where athletes performance was. Yeah. You know, because if you know L.A., it might be only be 19 miles, but it could be four hours yeah. or 20 minutes. So there was a little CrossFit gym up the street, went in there, started training, you know, paid the guys monthly. And yeah. the guy had told the, you know, CrossFit mothership, the the aliens at CrossFit yeah. that I was training there. Yeah. So then they approached me about doing the CrossFit games. Okay. And so a few days and, I, and at first I was like, no. And then I was like, what is this thing? Is a bunch of people working out. I'll go win yeah. this thing. Yeah. So they ended up showing up with cameras and they made a documentary. It's on Netflix called Every Second Counts. Okay. And it was, you know, this NFL player shows up to the CrossFit Games that he never CrossFitted. Yeah. And I had like 200 You got people. crushed, didn't you? I think I had a 200. I was like in the 70s, but I got murdered. Right. <laughs> well, I'm over there like competing in burpees against a 135 pound man. <laughs> and these dudes are fit as fuck. Yeah. You know, I'm like, I'm, I'm. Uh, 308 pounds, you know, yeah. getting ready to go play in the NFL. Yeah. Obviously not in CrossFit shape. Yes. So they, they make the documentary um, and then I go play for the Patriots. I get hurt. And then Glassman asked me about helping or coming to work for him. Yeah. And at the time I was filling out law school applications. You know, I had uh, applied for that scholarship, but my LSATs were no good. So then I was going to have to restudy and kind of oh, look into see, you know, because it only lasts for five years. Yeah. So then I was looking to see, hey, where do I want to go? How do I want to do this? And we reached out and kind of pitched me on it. And what I really was fascinated with was the CrossFit community, not yeah. necessarily him as an individual yeah. and the company, but like the, the community of people, yeah. because I'd lived in this ivory tower as an NFL player. All yeah. my friends were NFL players. We went places that other NFL players went yeah. and you meet other pro athletes, everybody trained, everybody lived this kind of lifestyle. And what I was fascinated by was, uh, I didn't know normal non-professional athletes wanted to know this stuff and more importantly wanted to train this hard. Yeah. I just kind of figured normal people went to the gym and did like, I don't know, like uh, Pilates and Smith yeah. machine and maybe like ran a triathlon or did a marathon. Like I just didn't think that there was actual non-athletes that wanted to strength train and performance train. Yeah. So when they, he, when I, I saw it, I was like, Oh my God, I've been doing this my whole life. Like yeah. there's a lot of information these people don't have. Yeah. So, uh, he hit me up. We launched, uh, it was called CrossFit Football, which was a terrible name. Um, we launched that, like, I think 30 days later, okay. 17,000 hits the first day. Nice. And then they asked me, like, hey, you're going to have to go on the road and go teach this information. Yeah. I had never taught a seminar. I didn't even really have information. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So we went out on the road. And that first year, I taught 36 seminars, uh, like, across the globe. I mean, in the United States, all over the world, because yeah. people wanted, and we'd show up. Uh, I'd show up with my crew Saturday morning, you know, Bodo, Norway. And with a backpack, and we would show up and work with these people for two days. And what, what happened was I was giving away a free training program through CrossFit Football. And then I got to travel the world for the next nine years and yeah. meet thousands of people that had done the program yeah. and data mine that. Yeah. Like, this will never happen ever yeah. again for the mere fact that, like, I gave away a free program. People did it. And then I got to travel and meet them, and they yeah. paid me to do it. Yeah. So we did that. And Power Athletes started pretty there shortly after when I realized that the trademark for CrossFit CrossFit football, yeah. they owned, yeah. and I was building brand loyalty into a, yeah. into a trademark I didn't own, so yeah. Power Athlete became my brand. Gotcha. You know, there was a branding issue. Yeah. So we continued to do that until you know, CrossFit and, and us just diverged too far and it became a bridge too far, yeah. where their methodology in terms of fitness and this was going, and we were so focused on performance that, you know, I mean, still seeing what they were doing and, you know, the fact that pretty much I think CrossFit is responsible for putting barbells in people's hands 100%. at a rate greater than Arthur Jones and Arnold Schwarzenegger and anybody else. Yeah. You know, I mean, for all Glassman's insanity and narcissism and all of his craziness, the fact that this movement that he started sparked, you know, garage gyms and this entire movement is, is amazing to me. Yeah. And, and, you know, you can't diminish his uh, contribution.
Yeah. But I mean, I just was going in way too different a direction. We started doing a bunch of military contracting. Okay. And when that hit up, that kind of necessitated a move and we came out here and, you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, COVID hits and it felt like everybody from California moved out here. I mean, this entire area was like rural, two lane little road, not a stoplight. And now it's yeah. four lanes and this. I mean, yeah. there's thousands. They built 7,000 homes up the street from us. Okay. Are you the only Cal Berkeley player to ever go to the NFL? No, 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 no. Aaron Rodgers. Oh, I didn't know that. All right. Uh, Tony Gonzalez. Okay. Uh, right. There was a lot of good, good players that played at Cal that went to go. Now, Cal's never had great college teams, but it's yeah. always recruited good players. Okay. And have had really excellent careers. I mean, yeah, like there's a yeah. lot. Those, lot are, of, those are good careers. I yeah. agree. I, I'm embarrassed that I didn't know. Yeah. At least, at least <laughs> no, no. It, it, well, people don't think Berkeley for yeah. uh, football. School. No, I definitely don't think Berkeley. But <laughs> if you ever get a chance to go there, Strawberry Canyon, where like Memorial Stadium is, yeah. probably, I think, and I've been to a lot of places. Yeah. Uh, is the most beautiful place to play a football game yeah. in the world. Yeah. No, I think I think the campus is, is oh my gorgeous. Gosh. Yeah. It's um I, I remember when I first, you know, on a recruiting trip when they took us there and, you know, Tilden Park and you're going through this and it's like the most beautiful campus on the planet. And then all of a sudden you look over and there's like a dude with dreadlocks like shitting on the side. Oh, and you're the- like <laughs> like there's these you're, like it, it was uh, like the craziest dichotomy of just weirdness. Yes. Of like, you know, we're in like the most picturesque, most beautiful place on the planet, but yet there's like this weird underbelly it was so strange yeah. yeah austin we have this this saying keep austin weird yeah, and austin does have some weirdness to it yeah. but it's nothing like berkeley no and uh i you know i appreciate it you know uh but i liked so i i, I really believe the reason that people from california come to austin is if you drive around especially this part of the hill country it feels like central yeah. california santa barbara um yeah. it, like i remember the first time my brother we were driving around he's like dude if i didn't know any better i'd think we were like somewhere in central california yeah. like in the wine country yeah the topography shocks people that think of texas as flat you know um so yeah it, it's gorgeous it's it's a beautiful area so we end up i've been here a decade so this is home for me too um and uh Where, know, I, where'd you live in philly uh grew up in like westchester area Okay. So, did you ever um, live downtown or anything? Not really. Maniac was the closest I got to downtown. Did Maniac? Yeah, all right. Yeah. Well, maybe the same time. Yeah, I, that, that's uh, why I graduated in '99. When'd you graduate? Uh, my first. Well, I graduated in '98. Okay. Uh, and then my first year, I got drafted. My first year in the NFL was '99. I was okay. living on 25th and Locust. Okay. Um, there was a huge kind of like retro apartment building yeah. deal, like right near the Schuylkill Expressway, yeah. the Skook. Uh, for those of you guys from Philly, uh, but I had a view of Franklin Field. Okay. Yeah. And then I lived there for two years and then I moved out and I, I actually rented a place in Maniac. We would have uh, been in Maniac at the same yeah. time. Yeah, that yeah. would have been oh, oh two. Yeah. And then uh, I decided to buy a house in Jersey, which okay. was a huge mistake. Uh, I should have bought one of the brownstones in Rittenhouse. <laughs> yeah. Like I kicked myself. You were making a lot more money than I was well, at that point. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> you ended up doing pretty good too. Uh, but I, I was going to buy this brownstone and the one issue I had was uh, it didn't land. And I looked at a bunch of them. The parking was so weird. Like there was like one spot for you, but if anybody came to visit you, there was no parking. And like, I remember being like, well, like if I had people come or like come stay or whatever, like I can get my cars parked. And so that was like a big issue, especially, uh, you know, because my mom and dad and my family and my brothers would come to games. And my mom was like, where do you park? And I'm like, on the street. And she was like, that's a terrible place. So I ended up like, okay, well, you know, I got friends and family coming. Like I'll move to Jersey, which was Camden. a huge mistake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, you drive really past through Camden. I lived in uh, Morristown uh, off okay, of 38. Beautiful area. Yeah. yeah. No, it was great. I had a big, yeah. uh, big property and had a lot of acreage, yeah. um, but I should have bought. And then the other one, um, I looked at this brownstone, but uh, I looked at an, a, a warehouse in Fishtown. Uh-huh. Uh, which at the time was extremely bad area. Yeah. But there was this huge warehouse and I kind of had this vision and I, I brought in like a contractor. Yeah. I was going to kind of build this, uh, uh, God, what was it? Flash dance. Do you remember where she had like the deal and they pulled the cars in and like, you know, ended up having this kind of yeah. deal and I was going to, I was going to build this. And then uh, I ended up just buying a house in Jersey yeah. and now Fishtown, they gentrification yeah. and like where that warehouse is, is there's probably 6,000 condos there yeah. now and they're, you know, it's worth a fortune. It's a, it's amazing to me that I, I don't, I don't know. I've never done real estate, but the vision people have for like, all right, this is a shithole. I'm going to figure out how to turn it around. That's, that's a gift that people, certain people have. That's, oh, and, and then also the moxie to be able to go yeah. in and fight with the city and the people and this, I mean, like, yeah. like, I mean, it's a huge return. I mean, yeah. that's why if you look at, you know, people, I mean, 
you know, you know, if you look at the extremely uber rich, it's usually going to be something in medical or something in real estate. Well, I'd argue tech. Yeah. So, so well, I mean, they, I, they're they're getting the scale. You know, the ability again, what's changed in the last twenty years is your ability to get scale, the speed at which you can get scale, and the total scope. I mean, it's a global market instantly today in a way it just it wasn't even twenty years ago. So, what's the process for um, you know franchises? Yeah, so uh, we because are, I'm, I'm fascinated by I mean uh, um, I'm fascinated by by franchise yeah, models. Yeah, and more importantly, because uh, I think it was a couple of years ago there was a big kind of health deal here in Austin, and I ended up uh, going to lunch with a bunch of the guys from Orange Theory, uh -huh. and there was a bunch of like uh, um, uh, franchises that they yeah. were kind of all pitching in the health space. Yeah, now the Orange Theory guys have done incredibly well. It's a great great brand, great concept that that's been really good. Um, yeah, we're we're very focused on making sure we have franchisees that fit three basic things. Number one, you have to be passionate about health. We see our best operators are, are those that wake up every day and are, you know, they're focused not only on their own health, but they see purpose in helping their communities. You know, they are, they are, and because of that, they're in their communities, people, they, they just establish that trust. Uh, two, we need people that are doing this full time. You know, a restore location is, um, it's different than uh, storage units. You know, there's franchises where you can go buy storage units, you build the storage units, you have one guy that sits there and Maybe he's there, maybe he's Those not. Those are pretty good businesses they're, too. They're not, I, I give that as the, <laughs> absolutely. Great it's a great business, but we're not that. Yeah, yeah. Um, You're not warehousing people. They're not warehousing people, that's right. And then, um, you know, so they have to be focused on this. They got to wake up every day and, and focused on growing their restore. Because, you know, we have RNs in the studio. You have, you know, multiple RNs or, you know, professionals there. You have a studio manager. Um, and it's, you know, you, you have to be able to manage a, a group of professional people that's a little bit different than a lot of franchises. And then third is you need to be in your community. Um, have to be in market, in community, we think is critically important. Um, we see our best operators there. That's what they are. Um, so if those are the three criteria. We have a, a demo day or called dial-in day. So once a month, uh, for people that are interested, we bring them into Austin. We walk through what it's like to you know, run a restore, what it you know takes to get into it. Um, and then we're right now, we are super selective. I'll, I'll be candid. We, are, we think the most important thing is having the right operators in the system. And um, we want to make sure we make the right choice on that. Early, early on the system, you'll appreciate appreciate this is um so i have uh i've neither jim or i had ever done a franchise this was new to us we're both tech guys so um so i spent a summer of i think a 16 just studying franchises so if i, if I don't i i get anxiety when i don't understand something so uh i went out i talked to you know franchisors franchisees every system from chick-fil-a um to mcdonald's to franchisees that were unsuccessful that nobody's ever heard of and, and in that, um, I'm kind of a weird parent in the fact that I bring my kids into almost everything. So I went and I, I pitched to the children. I said, here's, here's what we're looking at, Jim and I are looking at doing. Here are the advantages and disadvantages of franchising. And the biggest disadvantage of franchising is um, you can lose control of the brand. You get a bad franchisee, especially when you're, you know, you have, you're doing something as intimate as we are to, uh, to, the, um, to a client. And uh, it was my, my daughter at the time would have been like 11, 12, her name is Lena. And she's, she's like, well, why don't we have all the franchisees come stay at our house and we'll get to know them for a couple of days before we decide to bring it. So it was a brilliant idea. Yeah. And actually we did that. You know, so our early franchisees all had to come stay at our house for a couple of days. They had dinner with the family. We had them actually work in a studio. And our early decision on the franchise owners was just awesome. Our, our early franchisees, they were we knew what we were getting ourselves into. We sure. had a really good alignment on what we we're gonna do. Now you get to a certain scale, um, and that gets really hard to do. And you know, it's at a certain point, my uh, my wife didn't want to run a bit our Airbnb, sure. so uh, so we got away from that. Um, but we're doing a lot of those same things. We're brought back into the system. We're really making sure we get to know our, our owners. Our owners, the the ones that are successful, usually have multiple units. So mm -hmm. you know, they get they're good at one thing. That's a little bit of that is they self select because they're good at it. They're like, all right, I'll make this. I'm successful. I'm going to go open up additional units. And we like that. We think that that actually makes it easier to operate. Um, one of the big advantages of Restore versus almost any other brand is our memberships are universal. So um, if you're here in Austin and you're traveling to New York, you can use your membership. And that is a huge value because a very significant portion of our clients uh, travel around the country. Mm -hmm. you know, they're by their for work and for, you know, even for a lot of the athletes, they're, they're doing it because they're you know, running marathons in different places. So, uh, you know, right now that's, you know, what, what we're looking for for franchisees and you go to restore.com at any point. And, um, if you're interested, the, the very bottom, there'll be a tab says franchising, click on that and get to know us. What's the, um, I mean, I can't assume everybody's killing it. 
like everybody's successful. Is there uh, like, six, you know, because I remember with the franchise deal, they were real big on like the percentage of franchises yeah. that are, you know, keeping the doors open versus the ones that are, yeah. you know, kind of exploding. Is there uh, like industry standard outpacing? Um, they're, they're, they're industry standards. We're pretty unique in the fact that we are the largest direct to consumer retail business, healthcare business in this country. Oh. Like if you, if you think about it. With, a, with 250 locations. Yeah. 230. 230. Yeah. So think about who's who's larger. I mean, if you look at go to healthcare, if you're yeah. taking, it's CVS, Walgreens. If you look at really who have a healthcare infrastructure, we have the largest healthcare infrastructure from a breath. Again, Hospital Corporation of America sure. you know, has more, but you kind of look at direct to consumer, we're, we're the largest by by quite a bit. So we don't have a comp to actually compare to. Um, and, and I think that's because we've built out an incredible compliance system that works in you know, this country, right or wrong, is 50 different countries when it comes to healthcare law. Sure. There's 50 different medical boards, there's 50 different nursing boards, there's 50 different pharmacy boards. Sure. Um, I think one of our secret sauces is we built out that system that's compliant, you know, in, you know 40 states today, 50 hopefully long term, um, that makes it easier on our franchisees to get in and, and operate and be successful. Yeah, uh, navigating those HIPAA laws feels laborious. It, it, HIPAA is good because I believe it's national. The tougher one is, um, you know, California has very different laws in a lot of different areas than Nebraska does. Sure. Um, and that's where the challenge is in a lot of these areas. And, you know, one of the things that's both good and bad with our scale is, um, you know, we we adhere to the, we're compliant with the law. I mean, that's a focus. And we, for example, on the, um, on the marketing side, um, you know, we have franchises that get frustrated because we won't make claims that our competitors will. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm telling you right now, the claims are making, they're going to get in trouble at some point and sure. we're, we're not going to go down that path. But, you know, I think this comes back to the market is filled with a lot of bullshit. Um, I think over time, bullshit goes away. That's the good news. I think those those guys, the market and uh, filters those out. If things don't work, people don't keep doing it. This is what's great about capitalism. Yeah, well, I, I agree with you. I yeah. mean, uh, you know, the market will eventually figure out who's a player and who's not. Yeah. Uh, with the technologies, you know, you talked about red light, you talked about compression, uh, cryo, uh, sauna, which I'm a huge fan of sauna stuff. I mean, just the Finland studies, like 70 minutes a week and your chance of heart attack. I mean, uh, it's a sad realization that 95% of the people that are listening to this podcast that are in this world are going to die from either one of two things. It's either going to be heart attack or cancer. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's very difficult for us to control all the environmental toxins and whether or not you care to like, uh, admit it i mean it's you know something we've been going through uh the environment and what we're in with not only the food and the environmental toxins it's driving cancer whether or not they're going to admit it they, like it's 100 yeah. percent. you know we saw all those warning labels remember may cause cancer yeah. well it's because they do cause cancer and we know them to do it if you go on the cdc's website and you put something in you can see all the data i mean they know this stuff causes cancer and yet it's in our environment and uh i mean to the point where you know um like, for example, uh, what was it in Pennsylvania where they had that big uh, train go over and they said, was it in Pennsylvania? Ohio. Ohio. Um, you know, that stuff obviously went up into the atmosphere. Clouds move, rain down other places, and they're finding people that are contaminated with that, you know, hundreds of miles away from it. Yeah. So, I mean, we're living in an interesting time. So, I mean, the ability to detox and be able to, you know, sweat that stuff out yeah. uh, is like uh, – I think that, if anything, is, you know, because, you know, when people get out of it, all that's on your skin. If you wash it off immediately, it doesn't reabsorb. Yeah. So, I mean, like, it's pretty fascinating when you understand, like, this is something that potentially can not only mitigate, you know, well, let's say, you know, heart attacks, but also potentially detox the body and put us in a better state so that you don't have to necessarily weather these issues. Yeah. I know that the data on on saunas is absolutely compelling, and, oh and it gets stronger every day. Like like hyperbaric, the the data every day a new study comes out, you're like, wow, that's that's pretty amazing. Well, um, the hyperbaric stuff. I mean, like we talked about earlier, like I mean, w what a game changer. Yeah. And when I talk to people about it, like I um uh, I got a NFL guy coming next week who's going to come train with me for a few weeks, and as I was on the phone with him, you know, young guy going into his second contract, you know, year four, uh, you know, the hyperbaric thing. I'm like. If you were smart, have this in your house. Yeah. Or, Every, or go get a restore membership. Or, or go get a restore <laughs> membership. Exactly. You know, if uh, I assume they're, you know, they're all, I mean, in every major city. Uh, yeah, any major city for sure. Yeah, we're at, uh, we're at 40. Uh, there's probably, I, I should watch how I say that. I'm going to offend somebody, but it, it, there's not one there that's a major city, but I believe so. Now, 230 plus locations across the country. Wow. Yeah. Uh, has 
uh, I mean, I don't mean to ask about competitors, but I mean, you guys have gone so far in this direction. Are you feeling other people entering it or is this the barrier to entrance too difficult? No, because I see these weird testosterone clinics. Yeah. I call them like steroid, like, uh, uh, you know, legal. I don't know if they're legal, but they're steroid dealers is basically what they are. Like get your blood work, send us in. We're going to send you steroids. Uh, I won't comment on that. Uh, But that's like a huge, uh, these, what they call testosterone clinics. Yep. That is a uh, like massive cash cow. I, I have a few friends that literally cashed out of businesses and they're yeah. trying to build these things. And I'm yeah. always like, at some point, uh, the government is going to come and write yeah. whatever the cowboy shit's going on with this. Well, we're focused on making sure, again, we have a couple pillars of the company that, that we don't break. There has to be evidence that it creates good outcomes. That is number one. Like, you know, so this is how we avoid a lot of the bullshit that's out there is making sure there's actually, there is evidence. Now that doesn't always mean there's a double blind chemical, you know, uh, you know, clinical study. I mean, that pharmaceutical industry has done an amazing job of convincing everybody, unless there's a double blind study, there's no study. The reality is most things other than a pharmaceutical are hard to do as a double blind. It's hard for me to go, you know, Hey, let's do a double blind cryo study. You know, that's, that's an impossible task. So, um, I think that's, you know, one of the areas that we're focused on is making sure we have our own research team that looks at those things and brings the right things into, into those studios. Well, you have the ability to do research. Yeah. I mean, if you have standardized locations mm-hmm. and you have people coming in and you have a client set and more importantly, you have testing before and after yeah. and kind of the, all these health, uh, health metrics set up, yeah. you know, you can put somebody in and realize like, hey, this person had chronic pain, they've done cryo, they've yeah. done this, and no longer they're in pain, which is, is really fascinating yeah. to me too. They, uh, um, the discussion of pain is a wild one. Mm-hmm. Um, I Pain was never a deciding factor for me. And okay. I wonder if that's as an NFL player, like it's You're just, just used to pain. It's just part of the deal. Yeah. So it's like, like um, I have people like, oh, I'm in pain, I can't work out. I'm yeah. paying like this. I'm like, no, the way you get out of pain is you yeah. continue to train. Yeah. Like you train through that stuff and there's yeah. a barrier you break through. But we've been taught so much that, you know, pain is this, you know, neurological thing that forces you to do nothing. Yeah. And then it makes people sedentary. And I I was never and maybe just from the well, football. I, background. Say, I think that's that's the I uh, caution you on that. That's old is, thinking. Uh, no, it's more that, you know, everybody's different. Like you, yeah. everybody's thresholds are different. You know, one of my favorite stories is um my partner received an email from uh, one of our clients uh, and she said, thank you for saving my marriage. And he, he kind of, and then she, he read on and she had written to him and said, my husband couldn't get off the couch. Pain was there. He sat there and watched the news all day. He got pissed off the world. We didn't, couldn't do anything. And then um, he introduced him to cryotherapy and he started doing that. And that took the edge off the pain to the point he could then walk around the pond with me. Every night we now go and walks around the pond. And, and the reason I give you that story is like, your threshold is certainly going to be different than the average person's. Sure. And this is where everybody's different. And I think we have to look at personalizing medicine and healthcare for everybody based on their individual needs. It, it's just, we're, we're all born different with different thresholds. Um, I've no body fat. I'm cold always. I'm always cold. Like I live in Texas and Texas is too cold for me. Um, I suspect. You sound this, like my wife. I suspect in August, you hate this place. <laughs> uh, you know what? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm really good at, uh, extreme temperatures. Okay. So right. I'm, I'm good in the cold and I'm good in the heat. Okay. So I played in the hottest game in NFL history and I played in one of the coldest <laughs> ones and I wore the exact same t-shirt. So it, I mean, I do get tired of when it's been like, you know, we were like 70 days over 104 or whatever it was this year. Yeah. Uh, when, you know, I train um, some of the top Brazilian Jiu Jitsu fighters in the world. Yeah. And so those guys come and we train in the heat of the day at 1.30 yeah. in the gym and it's fucking hot. Yeah. And like, you know, you're in there and it's, you know, and then we go and roll and do all that. So I'm pretty good with the heat and I'm good with the cold, but uh, my wife is not a cold person at all. Yeah. Like I've never seen anybody like fear the cold. She grew up in New Jersey and she's little and yeah. she's super lean yeah. and she gets ice cold like, like this. Yeah. So I- I'm with her like this again, winter here is too cold for me. Even. Yeah. Well, uh, maybe global uh, climate change will help us a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> my friends in Pennsylvania are banking on that. Oh my God. I mean, uh, uh, I, I have a friend who's in upstate New York that has a, a company called uh, Tact Calories and New Spices and stuff. Yeah. And uh, he's in Rochester and we were on a call with him kind of just going over some new stuff. Yeah. And uh, like the blizzard outside was insane. <laughs> and uh, I said to him, somebody's like, Bill's mafia, baby. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's where people, they, they dig it. That's what yeah, they love. That, that's right. I don't get it. I, my wife and I spent a year traveling around the U.S. trying to figure out where to raise the family. And uh because I can't stand cold, but uh, where'd you look? Uh, San Francisco, San Diego, uh, Miami, Charlotte, and here. Mm. And this was the last stop, and we just instantly landed here, fell in love with it. It was it was the last place we came. Kind of was a it was a little bit of a flyer because again, going back a decade ago, Austin was not a thing. Yeah. Um, but you know, it, 
when you're here in Austin, what you realize is it's just down to earth. There's no pretentiousness to it. Um, Unless you live in B Cave and I got to follow people in Lamborghini SUVs yeah. everywhere. Yeah, that, that, there's a couple areas. Yeah. And that's, by the way, that's a new phenomenon. Yeah. That is, that well, is. Well, this is the, uh, this area in B Cave where I live just happens to be what we call the Orange County of Texas. Well, I was say, <laughs> that, that, that is the imported, those are yes. imported Lamborghinis. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, the uh, uh, Spanish Oaks. I mean, where uh, I joke that we live out here with, uh, you know, the country folk. Yeah. But if you go across the street where Spanish Oaks is, <laughs> Uh, it's, you know, and then just some of the neighbors, uh, I won't name drop them, but some of the people that live on the street, yeah. uh, like it, it'll blow your mind. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So for the most part, there's no ostentatious this year, there's, um, which I, which I appreciate. The schools are great. Um, the weather is great. If you want to live an outdoor life, you know, here, the problem is for some people, August, I think August is great. I don't know what they're talking about, but, um, yeah, good waters. It's a great place. Yeah. And it's, it's central. Yeah. Like, I feel like I can jump on a plane and go anywhere. That's right. And Southwest, I mean, it's like as much as I hate Southwest, to be able to jump on and get anywhere I need so yeah. easily. It's, I mean, California was a pain in the ass because yeah. anywhere you have to fly is just. Yeah. Uh, now, you can do a day trip to New York or California here. Yeah. And, uh, and I'll do almost anything to sleep on my own bed. So I appreciate that. Uh, I was very fortunate. Obviously, I lived in Philly, mm -hmm. uh, played for the Eagles, and then I lived down in Tampa, Florida, lived yeah. in Miami for a little bit. Yeah. Um, I would, you know, I, I did like Tampa a lot. That yeah. would have been a good spot to live. Um, lived in the Midwest. I would never live in the Midwest again. And yeah. then obviously went, you know, Northern California, Berkeley in that area, which is amazing. Yeah. And then, you know, Southern California. So I've been very fortunate to live and I, I definitely like Austin. Yeah. I, uh, I, I always wonder like this will be our final resting place where we'll live forever. Yeah. But I, I, you know, I, I get about every six or seven years, I get a little stir crazy and want to move. Yeah. So, which I think just comes from the NFL thing. The, the only thing we're missing is the, uh, the ocean. Yeah. You got to drive, you got to get to a good ocean. You got to drive to South Padre, which is a six hour drive. And it's not, it's not the same. S like, South Padre, have you been to South Padre yet? Uh, we went to uh, Port Aransas. That's a little and different. And it was like dirt water. Yeah. Now you get, you get South Padre, you start getting in the blue water. You're, it's right on the Mexico border. Okay. Um, so I'm, my passion is kiteboarding and surfing. Nice. Um, and the, the winds are great down there. The water's awesome. Um, South Padre is this un, you know, little secret in Texas that it's pretty amazing if you get a chance to go. So uh, uh, Victor Hugo, uh, mm -hmm. one of the BJJ yeah. guys I trained, he's from Florida Leza. Okay, yeah. Which yeah. is, um, you know, north, you know, on yeah. the coast in Brazil. And that's yeah. like the kite surfing spot for, uh, yeah. so he was showing me some videos. It was insane. Yeah. Now it's it's the most addictive. Yeah. I my challenge in life is it, it's hard for me to go bring the mind down and kind of relax. Um, and if I get on a kite, I can be hours and thinking about nothing other than kite surfing and what I'm doing right there. Yeah, and when you think about anything else, yeah. you're gonna totally crash. Well, that's all such a problem. Yeah. Oh my god! Like I, I see guys go up and they're like, Shh, it's yeah. uh, it's pretty dope. Yeah. Uh, is there um, like in the franchises? Um, is there kind of a critical mass number? Like, you know, like, um, you know, you, you have a pretty good business at 50 and 100 and 150. But it feels like when, when franchises, at least what I observed when I went to that event, anything over 150 starts hitting kind of critical mass. Where now all of a sudden, like, the difference between 50 and that was pretty, pretty dynamic. Yeah, I, I think in any business, there's what we dream to call escape velocity, which is you've now hit the point at which you can't be brought back to earth. Uh, and I think, you know, every franchise is going to be different based on, the complexity of the franchise um, and the kind of the capital structure that's needed to support that. Um, so I think it, it is unique for everybody. Um, the more complex, the more capital, the, the higher number you need to, to hit that escape velocity, which is also true of any technology business. You know, again, um, you, there there are companies can hit escape velocity with a you know a handful of clients just because they're big clients. There's others. You if you're direct to consumer, you need a you know a huge uh, kind of consumer set. So I think every business is unique um, in that franchising is no different. Um, where you got to figure out what is what is this point at which um, we have the ability to support the, the ecosystem that we're, we're um, that you're building because you know a franchise system is you know there there are advantages and disadvantages there are, you know obviously there are a number of companies that go just corporate owned and they own, own everything you know what most franchise systems will tell you is you cannot beat the person that's waking up every day that is feeding their family by running that studio and in that community mm -hmm. it is hard for me in Austin to hire somebody to go sit in Philadelphia to do what that person's going to do in Philadelphia every day. And that's why franchises usually, the franchise model usually outperforms the corporate system. Not, not always. There's, there's certainly, you know, that's, there's a lot of debate on that. Um, but, uh, you know, our feelings pretty strongly is yeah, that's part of the secret sauce is that owner that's passionate about their health and that, you know, their, their employees feel it. Um, the people come in the door, feel it, and you can't replicate that. I think it was, um, Outback Steakhouse 
uh, when, you know, obviously they, they do franchises. Yeah. When you hit a certain number, corporate will buy you hmm. or, or buy back that unit. Yeah. You know, basically refund your money, juice you out, and then yeah. ask you to go open a new one. And then they run it. Yeah. And that's I, that's more financial arbitrage than anything else, I suspect. Yeah. yeah I don't know. If, I don't know anything about Outback. But yeah, yeah. that was uh, uh, like I thought that was an interesting model where, you know, somebody proves himself and they, you yeah. know, basically buy it, pay cash you out and allow you to go do it again. Yeah. Which felt like uh, pretty smart, but I, yeah, I'm, I'm in agreement with you. I mean, at the end of the day, the person that wakes up each day where they have a vested interest, they're not just cashing a paycheck, but they're yeah. in the fight each day. Yeah. That person's always going to be dramatically more engaged yeah. than the person that's just yeah. cash and check. And for us, the corporate studios are super important. Um, we, you know, we don't put anything out into the system that we haven't tested at the corporate studios. And, you know, so. How many um, corporate studios? Uh, 14. 14. And so, are they all here in Austin? No, uh, there's, there are a couple of markets. Oh, there's, there's two here in Austin. And yeah. So, uh, but yeah, so that gives us, um, you know. Because I think there's one over at the Galleria. Yeah, that's a franchise that's one. That's franchise. Great operator. So that's a good example of, you know, they are in their community. They're part of Lake Travis football. They're part of Westlake soccer. Um, they're in that community every day. And and, and they, they're a great operator. It's one of our best. So, so yeah. what's the, um, what's like the, I guess you could say, uh, ferreting process or like, you know, when people have a technology and, you know, somebody approaches you with the technology yeah. that you think, oh, this isn't snake oil. Yeah. Let's try this. Yeah. Do you just bring it into the corporate offices and then you kind of test it and then offer it to well, the franchises? It, it, yeah. I mean, the, it, again, the inbound is off the charts. So oh. it's, yeah. <laughs> just the amount, <laughs> the amount of shit I get hit with every single day is yeah. uh, like, it's to the point where I'm like, this is ridiculous. It, it is. Um, it's actually, we, we, so we have a, we do have a process, which is, you know, our chief medical officer and our CTO's chief technology product officer, Jeremy Landis. And Jeremy's actually was a CrossFit. So his background was at SoulCycle and at CrossFit. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, before that, he was at tons of, tons of work with, uh, on continuous glucose monitors. Mm -hmm. So he's got a healthcare background and a consumer background what a truly unique talent so uh henry and jeremy kind of run this process where we look you know first question you know is is there evidence that this works that is literally the first sure. first thing on the list and then they kind of walk through you know how would this fit into the restore and by the way there's a lot of great products out there we choose not to do just not because they're not good products they just don't fit into our model um they don't fit into you know the rns you know in this country again certain states you have to have a medical doctor to do certain things certain states you need a you know an esthetician to do other things so it is you know we we kind of evaluate it through not only the efficacy of the product to the consumer but how it fits into our overall overall model across is, the country is everything um i usually break any of these kind of modalities into what i call passive versus active yeah you know like lifting weights training yeah. doing this is inactive whereas you know the passive stuff like a uh, hyperbarics or um you know cryo or this yeah. stuff kind of fits sounds like the majority of the things kind of fit within this passive restoration yeah i i love by the way i've, I've heard you talk about that in the past i love that description because i think that is very true so yeah most of what we do is in the passive now we are very clear with our clients there's another segment of this which well, is the active <laughs> The word passive uh, is not passive yes. it by any means, but it just kind of, for me, breaks in, especially yeah. with like, uh, I have uh, sort of like really interesting personal client set. I have a 72-year-old billionaire. Mm -hmm. um, I have uh, uh, SEALs from Development Group. And then I got my ultra guys, my yeah. uh, BJJ guys. Yeah. So I have a really interesting deal and I always break everything. Like, are you doing something active and passive each day? Yeah. Like, what are you doing something for restoration, whether it be, you know, stretching or, you know, going and having all these different modalities. And I tell them, try everything. Yeah. Like as long as the dude's not like, you know, doing anything weird where you have to leave and feel ashamed. Yeah. <laughs> like, but, but at the end of the day, like you have to explore. Yeah. Um, you know, like, uh, I have a, a guy from Arosti, uh, uh -huh. a company works on my yeah. shoulder, beats up the tissue and is probably the best I've ever seen for that type of work. Yeah. Uh, I don't, as great as he is, I don't recommend it for a lot of people because the pain factor and, the <laughs> like, I took my dad there and he would agree with you. <laughs> oh my God. I, I, I love it. But I, you know, I have this kind of uh, weird deal where, uh, I hurt my shoulder and like the, the capsule in the back kind of deteriorated. Yeah. So I got to get this dude to beat it up and this guy hammers it. Yeah. And I've had like a couple people go see him. Tony, if you're listening, you're the best. Um, but dude, he like, he's like, dude, like there's very few people that'll do this, but it works for certain people. Yeah. And there's a lot of different modalities and things that we run into. Um, I have Norma tech boots mm -hmm. and we use those. I mean, I bought them when my wife was pregnant cause her feet yeah. were so swollen Yeah, and I throw those on and I love them. And there's like some different things that we're really kind of, you know, into, whereas other people are like, ah, I didn't yeah. really see the effect. I'm like, it doesn't mean the product's not valuable. Yeah. Just like you said, everybody's an individual That's and right. more importantly, what allows them to work and function at a high level. Yeah. 
So, yeah, no, the Rossi was funny. My, my father probably was like 74 at the time. I like that. I hear this place is awesome. We're going to take you there. I know you're you know, lower back problem. And he talked me out. He's like, you just paid money for the torture. <laughs> <laughs> and he was pissed off for days. <laughs> that was the last time I, I took him somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, there's um, so uh, fascia is fascinating. Yeah. Like, you know, like in medical school, you know, 20, 50 years ago, they just talked about like the white stuff they cut through to get to the muscle. Yeah. But we've since understood that like now fascia is kind of this, like uh, this armor in a lot of ways. It kind of connects all the stuff. And there's also, um, and I know this is a little hippy dippy, but it's where you store all your emotional energy oh, yeah, is right. in the fascia. Uh, horses, uh, which, cause I live next door to about 60 of them. Yeah. So I have this like constant, uh, like, uh, like a lot of observation and we're in being around horses, they are not smart animals, yeah. but they have a really high emotional quotient and they are extremely uh, emotionally intelligent animals uh -huh. from the fascia. And, you know, did a bunch of research on this. And so when you talk to anybody that doesn't need a myofascia release, yeah. uh, the amount of emotional things that come to circle <laughs> when like, People start working through the fashion, getting through it. Like the stories are epic. Like yeah. people are like, you know, and then when I was six, my dad didn't buy me a phone, you know? <laughs> and this guy's like, I'm, I'm just trying to help this guy get a little myofascial release. But if you talk to like rolfers or people that do a lot of myofascial work, like they're, they're like, you know, they, they have to have like a tissues and like anger. I mean, people have a lot of pent up stuff that is stuck. And then when yeah. you start working through this. So, well, my father, it was his anger released on me. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, good thing. I'm a punching bag. Hey, you try to get me on this. So do, do you guys have a, like do any of that, like kind of body work massage that we, we, we did for years ago, we had a stretch business. Um, and, and you know, I still kind of like str stretch lab, uh, like a stretch lab. Yeah. And I still strongly believe in stretch. Yeah. Um, when we looked at it, it just didn't fit our model particularly well. Um, and I think there are people doing a good job with stretch. So, you know, one of the things we look at, make sure we can differentiate ourselves and we have defensive barriers around the business. Um, and that was one we just didn't see a way to build long-term defensive barrier the way the majority of our business today, we think we're building barriers around it. What do you mean defensive barriers? Um, the, the barrier to entry to get in the stretch is extraordinarily low. Yeah. Okay. Um, go put, put, put up a table, find some dude off the street, train him um, and you got a stretch lab or stretch business. Um, that's very different than, you know, hey, we've sourced these micronutrients from these five compounding pharmacies that we think are um, are differentiated. They're better products that are out in the marketplace. Um, we've trained a nurse how to administer those and we've developed a sales and client service process around how to connect with that client and then store all that information and down the road we'll be able to give them back to them so they see hey it's a know, much higher barrier to yeah. entrance so now you're you're into a, a bigger barrier to entry our, our new weight management program and by design we call it weight management not weight loss um is is again huge defensive barriers in the fact that we've we've uh, created use an in-body machine that mes measures visceral fat and you know body fat around the body you know how accurate is the in-body uh, we fit, we did a number of tests on a, other products in the marketplace. We think Embody is a very accurate product. Now oh. that you gotta be, you gotta be careful on, um, you know, your diet before you go in. What I found is cause I use it pretty consistently is as long as you do it the same time every day and kind of a, a part of a routine, it's directionally absolutely correct. Um, but what we're doing is on, on those studies. So, you know, GLP ones are something that everybody's heard of these oh, days. Yeah. Yeah, the um, and, uh, you know, what's different about the restore program is number one, it's not just, Hey, come get a shot. It is here's, you could talk to your, uh, your nurse practitioner once a month, you're getting coaching that is beyond well above and beyond, um, that of, you know, Hey, just take a shot. But two, we're embedding not only blood work where you can see the change in, in outcomes of the blood work every six months, but we're also you monthly get on the in body machine because what we're really focused on and some of the negatives on the GLP ones is you can have lean muscle mass loss. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Rachel, our, our head of, um, research, one of my favorite lines she said is muscle is a longevity drug. Yeah. Um, so weight loss is incredibly important. Um, however, it's also incredibly important to continue to have that muscle mass. So we keep monitoring that. So we're making sure that you're losing fat as opposed to muscle. And, uh, and I think that's what's differentiating our product. And we're doing a ton of research on that to be able to show this, pl this platform with these products and other things we do in the studio that are part of the weight management, ultimately make sure the client loses what, what they need to lose, which is fat, not that muscle that is critically important to our longevity. Mm -hmm. No, it's... Um Man, that's uh, that's intelligent. I mean, yeah. the um, like the all the Ozempics and all the different things that are coming out. I mean, the weight loss clinics. It just feels like uh, probably overwhelming for a lot of people. But if you look at the the research, I mean, it's pretty conclusive that if somebody loses twenty pounds, 
uh, usually the blood work comes into focus right. and, you know, but then also, you know, we don't, like you said, we had uh, Gabrielle Lyon on the podcast, you know, she's done, it's pretty funny. We've been talking about muscle being the most important thing that you can have and this yeah. but it's the greatest determining factor for longevity. I mean, we've yeah. been beating that train for almost 10 years and it yeah. was great when she came in where she talked about like, you know, muscles, life, muscles, power yeah. and really changing the, like the conversation for especially women who were so opposed to muscles for so long. But yeah. I always joke too, that that's probably CrossFit's uh, influence where now all of a sudden, like being jacked as a girl is kind of cool. Yeah. And uh, I didn't see that. And that was another thing too. You know, I'm, I'm a father of daughters like you are. Um, I liked the fact that uh, strong women and people, women that could lift weights and that were capable was yeah. something that was held in high esteem. Yeah. And, uh, you know, not just a bunch of dudes that were like, oh, they look like, you know, these women look like men. Like, it's stupid. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, strong, capable women that can lift weights and do things and, you know, that are athletic and they're doing athletic things. Yeah. Like that's a, um, uh, that narrative is probably the best one I've seen. Yeah. I think the other other thing that's hitting people realizing about the weight management is number one, we, let's be honest, we have an uh, obesity epidemic in this country for sure. But number two, um, it's a lifestyle thing. Like if you if you're overweight, you can't live the life you want to live. Yeah. Um, and you know, uh, you know, we one of my best friends is you know is actually on on our products, and. Um, you know, if you were to look at him, he's not morbidly obese or anything close to it, but I go kiteboarding with him all the time. I go hiking and skiing with him. Like it is harder on his body because he's carrying probably 20 pounds that he needs to lose. And, you know, he's an intelligent individual. He is somebody that knows what he's doing. He's educated. Um, you know, the idea of telling him to eat less Oreos has not worked for the last 20 years. So sure. there's there's something else there that we got to help these these people with. And I think that's what we've really focused on at Restore is building a, a program, not just, hey, go get an injection, but an entire program on trying to manage weight and make sure you have good, healthy objectives as well. Mm. So did they do um, like nutrition coaching as well and mm -hmm. diet plans? Yep. Wow. Yeah. And again, it's in studio. Um, so one of the advantages, there are a lot of online offerings that are out there. Sure. Um, nothing, again, nothing wrong with that. There's some great companies uh, doing it. Yeah, I do think there's a need yeah. to have that personal touch. Well, I, I think it's a combination of both. Yeah. I, I think people need, um, and we're, we're seeing this because, you know, we do, um, you know, certified coaches and yeah. work with kind of some individuals on in, like kind of personal. Uh, the majority of people are online, but I think that there is a market for a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. I think people need to have autonomy to be able to do it themselves and have like kind of monitoring with a coach, yeah. but they need to be able to show up and plug in and learn from people that are, are knowledgeable yeah. and be more importantly, be exposed to new things. Yeah. You know, the, the gym that we have, um, I call my lab. I mean, it's kind of a joke, but uh, I'm constantly bringing in new equipment and trying new things. Like we're yeah. messing with force plates now. And, um, you know, uh, we've been testing like the EWAT, the exercise with oxygen, which okay. is an incredible technology. And just using different things and seeing how they work mm -hmm. and, you know, putting them to practice. And then that way, when people ask you questions, you have an intelligent response. Yeah. More so than like, I don't know. This, yeah. isn't, this isn't what I do. Yeah. And really for my company with Power Athlete, you know, the idea was performance. Mm -hmm. And when you're focused on performance, you don't get stuck in dogma. And yeah. I think, you know, what I saw across it get bogged down why it was increased work capacity, broad time, modal domain. So they were kind of in this high engine, high glycolytic output constantly as yeah. the driver for fitness. And it's good until it isn't. Yeah. Or it becomes too much oxidative stress or you physically can't do it. Yeah. And so that idea of kind of pivoting into this idea of performance where now the best version of you is out there, mm -hmm. how do we put the right plugs to be able to make it happen? Which yeah. sounds similar to what you guys are doing. Yeah. I think, again, I think, what I love about what you're doing, it's personalized. I think this, again, that we, we as, a, as a society, but on healthcare, uh, we got to get out of this idea of, hey, I have all the answers for you. And, you know, here's exactly follow this. And everybody's going to be the same. I, I just don't think that model's working for Americans. Yeah. Well, the, um, so I, I was on a, um, a call last, no, well, earlier this week uh, with uh, Kahif Khan. He's uh, the DNA, you know, does okay. all the DNA stuff yeah. and they do a uh, DNA testing. And then based upon this, they kind of do this kind of coaching deal. So I listened to his, his whole deal and yeah. uh, the DNA stuff is really fascinating to me yeah. because I think we thought that everybody was going to, you know, once you get your DNA done, yeah. this was going to be, you know, the roadmap for every individual. Yeah. And we're realizing now that it's not. <laughs> so I'll, I'll just give you a deal. I, I, you're going to laugh at this. Uh, I got my DNA done through these guys called the Amsterdam New Genomics. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's kind of a... M MIT deal and uh, you know, you pay in and then they give you research yeah. and you're in kind of this pool forever yeah. where it's like, you know, the, here's your DNA. This is what it looks like. And here's all the research. And I, yeah. I get research updates almost every week yeah. on my DNA profile. Well, I go into my little portal and a hundred percent, I have a, 
you know, full circle for 100%. This is a genetic condition. Yeah. And it's an amylase deficiency, which should result in any form of physical activity, that extreme muscle pain, <laughs> to the point where if I exercise too much, I will die from rhabdomyolysis. Yeah. And 100% I have this. Yeah. And uh, I'm like looking at it and I, I get on the phone and I send an email and I get on the phone with the guy and he, I'm telling him this. And he's like, yeah, you 100% have this. Have you noticed any conditions? I'm like, uh, no, I played in the NFL for 10 years, <laughs> beat the cross of games, train every day, and I've never had this. And the yeah. guy got real silent. And I'm like, you still there? He's like, no, I'm just realizing here's another day yeah. where I don't know what's going on with this genetics. Yeah. And so then, you know, now we've been in this for a number of years. You know, every, you know, there's more bacteria in the body than there are cells. Yeah. Every piece of bacteria can affect every gene in multiple yeah. ways. So now, like, you might have this genetic, but there's higher orders to this. Yeah. And so, the you know, when I got on this call, this guy was like, oh, if you have this and this and this, I'm like, unless you don't. And more importantly, like, how are you measuring these people on the backside? And then when he kind of, hey, this is what our coaching does, it yeah. looked like monitoring people's sleep. Yeah. Getting them to exercise. Yeah. Building an aerobic base. Uh, getting them to eat better. Yeah. Um, if you're micronutrient deficient, fixing that. Yeah. And I'm like... <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I, I don't need. To, I don't need a genetic test to tell you. You know that, like, uh, you know. I mean, we've been beating the wardrobe on a high protein diet for forever. Yeah. Since I started working with Mauro De Pasquale in '99, and you know, now all of a sudden, you know, you have people that are obsessed with like a carnivore. I'm going to eat yeah. nothing with meat, but the research shows that the healthiest people on the planet can eat the most diverse diet. Yeah. So by self selecting into one food only, you're, you know, I mean, like, and and you know, because you do the micronutrient testing, yeah. like. It's incomplete. Well, th this is where I think AI is going to change things in the next decade. I think, again, the data sets are there. So take the genetic uh, test you did. Like, they're right. I'm, I'm not questioning whether they haven't identified that correctly. But there's so many variables. I mean, the problem with all you know, these systems is the amount of variables in the human body. It's like trying to predict the, you know, the weather a decade out as well. Sure. There's just too many variables to try to understand. Um, I think now you're, you're being able to train AI engines to be able to take those data sets, learn from them, and make better understanding of that data. And I think without that, I think it's just been too hard. And genetics is probably the best example of that. We just... You know, uh, that's not the first story I've heard similar where I was told, hey, I have this genetic mutation, which clearly I don't have. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, yeah, I, I believe I 100% have this. Yeah. It's just there's other orders to yeah. this. And then on top of it, what if I had gotten that at 10 years old? Yeah. Then would they have been like, oh, you have this, you can't do this. Yeah, things. and that would have changed your life by yeah. convincing and you you can't it, do something. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, I, I wonder if a lot of times um, it's pre predictive programming in some way. Yeah. That you're obviously, you know, like the ones where they, uh, you know, oh, you were an athlete, you're not. And then, it's not and causal. No. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I'm always wondered, like, no, don't get saddled with this stuff. You yeah. know, I, I don't want to know the ending of the movie before it happens. That's a very good way of looking at it. Yeah. So uh, what's the goal for Restore? Um, the goal is to be in every community in this country and, you know, look back and say, when a Restore is in a community, the community is healthier. We have that big an impact where, you know, if you're in a community and you want to improve the health of that community, you're going to say, like, how do we get a restore here? And I, that's, that's for us will be success when we get to that point. We are a long way from it. Uh, we have a lot to do to, to bring the data to life, to show clients how we're changing their outcomes. Um, and But I, I think we're certainly on our way there and I couldn't be prouder of the team. We have an absolutely amazing team, uh, mainly based here in Austin, Texas, uh, but you know, it's a little bit spread out throughout the country um, that's really bringing that that to life. And, and we have amazing franchisees that are waking up every day and, and making the system uh, be successful. Wow, that's killer. Yeah, it's good life. Yeah, no, I'm uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by it. Yeah, uh, well, you were going to sign you up for a franchise. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> let me add another. You look like you, I, I'm not sure you would, you would qualify for our focus. Uh, it seems like you have a lot going on. Oh man, I uh, uh, like I am always fascinated when people tell me they're bored or they're not busy. Like I, I like I feel like every single day I don't get done what I need to get done yeah. just because there's so much on the plate, but I would much rather be busy than not busy. Yeah. And I think for people doing this, um, like you have to sink your life into doing something. Yeah. And you know, like I, I, like when you're saying people have multiple locations, I mean, they probably started with one and mm -hmm. then they kind of added to it because they have the systems in place yeah. and they can kind of share within like, like, you know, the doctors and this, I mean, I like the staffing issue is what almost gives me anxiety. Yeah. Now, I, I, I'm a strong believer focus wins. Like, you know, the, the, the people that wake up every day focused on one thing, I think they are going to win versus those that are trying to do a thousand things. That's one. Well, the age old, uh, the man that tries to sit on every seat sits on no seat. Yes. Yeah, that's a good one. I like that. Yeah, that's another good. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other one is, you know, I, I this idea of the retirement, this has been on the news a lot lately. Right, right, um, you know, 
you know, my mentor, one of my mentors, um, I once asked him what his retirement plan was, and he said a wooden box under the ground. And uh, and by the way, he unfortunately passed away recently um, in his uh, mid eighties, and he worked until the end. And I'll tell you what, he had purpose. Um, he was excited every day, and I think you know this idea of hey, I'm going to go retire and sit on a beach, you know. I, I just don't see it for myself. Uh, Again, everybody's so, their stuff, but I'm not, that's not me. I have a whole theory on this. All right, let's All hear right. it. So my dad told me, uh, so my dad was a trial attorney. Yeah. You know, um, my dad was super smart. Graduated high school at like 16, mm -hmm. graduated college at 19, had his law degree by the time he was 21, working two jobs, you know, and I mean, just an incredibly intelligent guy. Uh, and extremely condescending when smart people are really <laughs> smart and they know they're really smart. So my dad grew up with a really smart condescending father, which is probably why my sense of humor works the way it does. Cause I'm like, first of all, you idiots aren't as smart as my dad. You no way you're as big a fucking prickly assholes. Um, but my dad, uh, you know, as he, you know, he practiced into his eighties mm -hmm. and you know, I like my mom would kind of, you know, you got to slow down. And he's like, you know, every guy that I ever worked with who was a lawyer that went to the judge and, you know, went to the bench and then retired and this yeah. within six months, they were all dead. Yeah. And he goes, I've, I've gone to too many funerals. Yeah. And so when, uh, I asked him once, he's like, you know, I found out like, uh, this, or he goes, I found the cause of early death. Yeah. It's retirement. Yeah. Because what are you going to do? You're going to go home. You're going to go play golf. Yeah. And my dad's like, I like to play golf yeah. and I like to travel. But what am I going to do for the other? He goes, yeah. and, and my dad, I did this deal. He goes, I want you to write down on a list every single thing that you want to do on your bucket list. Yeah. Anywhere. Just write everyone down. Yeah. And so we kind of did this little thing. And I realized if you gave me, let's say, $100 million yeah. and I never had to worry about paying a bill ever yeah. again and I got to have a private jet and travel here, it would take us about two years yeah. to, to do and see yeah. the pyramids in yeah. here. I mean, he's like, write it down. You want to go down the Congo? You're like, we wrote everything out. And he's like, like this is two years of your life. Yeah. And he goes, and then what would you do? Yeah. He goes, you'd seen everything. Yeah. And he goes, or you could bust your ass and work really hard for a few months yeah. and then go, you know, like I said, hang out on a boat or, you know, do this. He's like, or you could just continue to work and then just take, you know, some more and more adventures. Yeah. But, you know, at 80, I asked him, uh, you know, when he was, you know, like, so my dad, um, hit me up right after Christmas and he's like, Hey, I've been going to this guy and he keeps telling me I got bronchitis and I got an ulcer, yeah. but something's wrong. So we went to uh, my doctor out in Arizona and they looked and he had stage four stomach and liver cancer. Um, they thought that the ulcer was stomach cancer and the liver was pumping out a bunch of cirrhosis. So the yeah. water or the, the fluid yeah. that they thought was uh, bronchitis yeah. uh, or pneumonia was really just coming out. So, yeah. um, and that was right after Christmas and he was, he passed away February 28th. Yeah. So he was here two that. months. Yeah. I mean, but never worried about what he ate, ate yeah. whatever he wanted, yeah. didn't really exercise that yeah. much, worked, I mean, lived his best life and, I, and made it to 80. Yeah. And I tell people, I'm like, uh, that dude did exactly what he wanted at all times, yeah. gave no fucks about like, hey, like we, we would go places for dinner, we'd open up the menu and we would secretly take over unders, like, like what do you think dad's gonna order? <laughs> and they'd be like, oh, uh, uh, that uh, deep fried pork butt, I'll take that one. <laughs> to the point where we would just search for the worst thing that sounded and that was what he was gonna order. It's like, yeah. that sounds good, I'll have that. Yeah. And my mom would flip out. Yeah. But he said, he goes, uh, if you retire, like, like, where is your purpose? What are you going to follow your wife right. around? And he's like, eh, he's like, it's a, it's the reason people get divorced. Yeah. Uh, it's the reason that um, you die. So yeah. he's like, you know, and he literally um, tried his last case on the 16th and uh -huh. then he took off for Christmas. And then we found out he had that. And like the hardest thing for him was actually submitting to the California bar yeah. that he was going to have to take because uh, he had been 55 years as a constant travel or a, a trial attorney. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, but I, I, the hard thing for me is, and, and uh, um, you're never a king in your own kingdom, right? So I talked to my dad constantly about this stuff, but he didn't believe me. Yeah. And I remember being like, dad, you got to eat better. We got to exercise. You got to do all these things. So you have longevity. Yeah. And he's like, ma, you don't know. You don't know your ass about cold. Like that. <laughs> and I, I remember like what was kind of uh, incredible, like this, you know, like he had an amazing life. And, yeah. and as we were going through kind of at the end with his bucket list, yeah on his bucket list was to redo everything that he'd already done, but uh -huh. he wanted it to do it with us. Like he's like, you guys haven't seen the Galapagos. Yeah. You guys haven't seen the great wall of China. Yeah. And he goes, I wish that I had seen it yeah. with you guys. Yeah. So the ability to be able to share all these moments with your family yeah. and to be able to go and have these amazing adventures that you sit back and laugh about, like that's what was most important. Did you get the Galapagos? No. Oh, that's a shame. The Galapagos is worth it. Yeah. He, worth he, he, he was big. Um, 
so my dad was a big rotary guy uh-huh. of a big yeah. Rotarians. and started his own rotary club and yeah. uh they had this he somehow got linked in with these rotarians around the world where they had all of these epic scuba diving trips okay so he went with this like rotary the some like rotary group traveled yeah. and they went to the galapagos they went to truck i mean yeah. he literally scuba dived all over the world and went by himself didn't take yeah. my mom because my mom didn't want to scuba dive yeah and he's like you don't want to go I'm, yeah. I'm going without you yeah and uh just had the you know badass life yeah but he could have lasted so much longer yeah and well i often say the best thing that happened to my dad was you know at 70 you know getting that heart scare where he had to have the bypass surgery he first of all it turns out in hindsight you know a couple years later he felt better than he had felt the years before that you know uh before that uh, the the uh, fact he went through heart surgery and again he had five blockages over 90 oh. percent. so i mean he he should have isn't never the human survived. body resilient the human body is resilient i think one of the things for him he was in such good shape that actually i think it masked the problem because he went back to the doctor multiple times like something's not right here they, and they didn't pick it up on the first first three stress tests what was his exit like did he was he a he plays he plays tennis, oh, that's right, tennis to this day he plays tennis every day um it's pretty pretty remarkable um but that that he changed that was a life-changing event where he went from drinking you know five di- dr peppers a day to drinking water and you know he does still you know he kind of eats meat but he eats very little fried food if any and yeah. uh and very little dark meat and you know his cholesterol is lower everything about his health you know eight years i guess seven or eight years later now in many ways is better is better wow so obviously don't want you know my father to have to have a you know five bypasses but um i think actually you know he probably is here today you know had he not had that scare i don't know that he'd be be here today and as much as people shit on the uh, the medical industry if you have five bypass or five blockages and you go in they have like uh like you know like like i always said if if it's like something acute like a car accident a gunshot a heart attack like we are really good yeah. about saving those people. Yeah. It's just a managed care thing where we haven't figured out. Yeah, of all the knocks of this country in our healthcare system, if you give me a real problem, I want to be in America versus anywhere else in the <laughs> <Yeah>. world. <laughs> no, no. Talk all you want about Cuba and Russia. I think this this healthcare system works pretty well. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's expensive, but um, no, it's, uh, it, yeah. No, I mean, I I think part of the issue we've run into, and, and you know this, you know, from your first exposure, it's um, you know pharmaceutical driven medicine, yeah. you know, and the idea of you know better living through pharmacology, and there's a pill for everything, yeah. and uh, you know, I I actually had a conversation with the doctor one time. He's like, it's easier for me to prescribe drugs yeah. than it is for people to make a life change, and the only time people make a life change is in the face of imminent death. Yeah. Like I have a heart attack or this, or, you know, yeah. he's like the amount of people that I have come in who, you know, my dad just died of this colon cancer. I want to get a colonoscopy. Yeah. He goes, it's very reactive instead yeah. of, you know, all the other issues. And then all of a sudden, you know, these problems come to light and now we got to throw Hail Mary. Yeah. And, and here's the reality. If you're, if you're making changes when you're in your sixties, that's, that's a lot of built up damage over a period of time. I think this is why you got to invest when you're young. The investments, you know, like every, like you have an investment return on capital when you make investments. You get a compounded interest. The same thing is true on your health. You get compounded interest. The healthier you are, the longer you are, it benefits you later in life in a, in a different way. Has um, has the medical, I'm going to say like the, the juggernaut of medicine kind of come at you guys um, as almost like a partner in some ways, just for the mere fact that you have the ability to test a lot of things. Like I'm always fascinated and we, you know, we have this through, you know, all the coaches that I'm, I'm, uh, I've certified and continue to train athletes. We have a discord and the amount of information that comes through that are like, Hey, I'm, I'm training this user. We're working these volleyball. You know, we have this huge kind of robust, uh, almost like, I guess you could call it like an experiment that's uh-huh. happening in terms yeah. of performance training. I wonder for the amount of data sets that you guys have, because it's, uh, it, it's extremely controlled. Yeah. Um, you know, you have systems in place to basically monitor all this. So it's pretty interesting, like, you know, as these outsiders to come in and be able to drop things in to see if there's a notable change. Yeah. We're ne- we're just now hitting that point where we have the scale and the infrastructure internally from our own data sets to be able to do that. So we're, we're starting to begin or beginning those now. And I think in the next couple of years, you'll see some really cool stuff come from us because of that. Oh, that's rad. Yeah. So any questions for me? Um, are you a Texan for good? Uh, I think as long as we live in the United States, I will probably always live Wait in a Texas. Second. Where, where else would you go other than the United States? I don't know. I, I, I told my kids uh, that I, I, I would have liked to have lived in a foreign country for them for a year, like whether it be in Spain or Switzerland or somewhere else so that they could get a better, um, like just a, a, a like... 
I think when you travel, and mm-hmm. I've, I've been very fortunate to travel. Yeah. I mean, not only as an NFL player I traveled, but when I worked for CrossFit, yeah. I, you know, I traveled, I mean, taught hundreds of seminars in full, you know, countries and got to go meet people. And it gives you a greater perception of the world and it makes yeah. you much more worldly and just gives you a better global awareness. And I, the thing I've always disliked about Americans is they don't travel. And they're very like myopic in this, like they don't understand the global landscape. I mean, if you ask people being like, you know, what's the capital of Egypt and this, I mean, we have terrible knowledge of the world, but yet you go to a foreign country and people still speak English. They know what's happening. And uh, I don't want my kids to not grow up with that. And so I was very fortunate when I was young, my parents, like I said, you know, my dad, you know, worked and then he would travel and, you know, we went to, you know, the UK, we went to London, we traveled to all these different places. And as a kid, it was extremely impactful for me, you know, walking around in London and looking at all these different castles and, you know, seeing these little tiny suits of armor and realizing that none of these guys were over five, four. Yeah. (laughs) But I, I think it just gives you a greater perception and more importantly just makes you um, more ability to navigate this kind of global world well, i also think you get you get ideas you know the amount of times i've thought of something and you know the idea came from somewhere other than here i think that the more exposure you get to other just even philosophies of way of life um, that benefits you as a kid and, and as an adult as you get in your professional career well i like you spending a month in the Mediterranean, I would like to do that. Well, um, that that is nice. Uh, that's a, a nice perk. We, we didn't cover that one on the on air here, John. Uh, no, on, on air. But uh, <laughs> when you said that, like I, I got a little jealous because I was like, man, that's. Uh, I mean, that, that's something that um, uh, I saw a pretty fascinating statistic that like ninety percent of the time you spend with your kids is before like the age of twelve, yeah. and then like five percent from twelve to eighteen, and then after that, like your time with them is yeah. done. So I see my daughters at twelve, and I'm yeah. you know in this situation where my little boy is now like eight, and he's like yeah. he's pretty ready, ready to go. Yeah. And I told my wife, I'm like, we need to make a yeah. better chance to be able to go out and do on some of these vacations. Yeah. We're not vacations. I hate I hate the term vacation. Yeah. Vacation to me is sitting Exploring around exploring the world. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm like the terror, like my, my wife and I have a different vision. She like wants to go to Costa Rica and like we went to a pool and this and I'm like, let's get in a car and go into the jungle. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm all, and she's like, all you want to do is have adventures. I'm yeah. like, yeah, hundred percent. I want to yeah. get a car and I want to go figure out and find in this and go here and yeah. get on a boat and do a million different things. Like me yeah. sitting by a pool, having drinks is good for about one day. Then I'm like, I don't even have a day in me. So, so. yeah, I think one of the things I'm most proud about my own life is, um, you know, I sold my first company when I was 30. Um, a lot of people when they sell their first company at 30 and have, you know, passive income that exceeds their, their burn, you know, I think Scott Gallagher says, you know, that's his definition of rich. Um, they follow one or two paths. Um, they either go live on a beach and become a bum again, not judging that nothing wrong with that, or they go and they try to become a billionaire and, you know, work 900 hours a week. You know, I think I've found, and I'm proud of a uh, good balance in that through this year. So I'm super involved in the kids' lives. Um, that is a priority. I kind of put my life in three buckets. I have uh, family, uh, uh, work, and then myself. So, and, and I've, I've kind of, I've balanced this pretty well. Now I will tell you, I get out of balance sometimes. I'm out of balance right now. I am very heavy on the work bucket, very much so, uh, more so than I, than I certainly like to be at this point. But, you know, the nice thing is my kids, I've been a stay at home dad. So my kids, when they were in the right age, you know, they do remember dad was around a lot and now they see you know, dad's busting his ass. And I think that that gives them the respect for both of those buckets and, and how, you know, life's not always totally in balance. Yeah. Oh uh, no! Growing up, uh, I saw my dad on the weekends. He'd get up at five a.m. and he'd be in court, driving here and drove over, you know, working and get home at eight o'clock at night. And we'd see him on the weekends, and uh, I didn't want that for my kids. Yeah, you know, I wanted them to know that we were around and be able to see a lot more. Yeah. Um, it wasn't. It was. It was wild until like I when I graduated high school and went to Berkeley to go play and then obviously got to go to the NFL, my dad came to all of the games. Oh, really? And so he didn't really come to much <laughs> of our games. So my mom used to talk shit to him and be like, oh, you only showed up once it got interesting. <laughs> and he's like, I was out there working. She's like, you were living here, you know? So it's this constant battle, but uh, he was at every game. Yeah, um, I mean, I bet you he went to 90% of my games. Yeah. You know, you go play in Green Bay, Wisconsin and come walking out and there he is. He came solo and it was uh, it was awesome. It was something that he loved. And What um, did he think of Eagles fans? Oh, he loved them. Okay. Yeah, he, he loved the Eagles fans. I mean, if you play for the Eagles and you're wearing Eagles green yeah. and you show up to an Eagles game, yeah. uh, especially if you're wearing a jersey and he, he would wear my jersey, obviously, yeah. with his name on the back. Yeah. Uh, and to be sitting there and then people figured out that, like, that was my dad. He's yeah. like, honestly, like, he's like, you could do anything in the stadium. He's like, he's like, if somebody were to push you, there's a thousand people to come punch him in the face. My dad's like, I've never felt so safe being at an Eagles game wearing your jersey when people realize that I was your dad. All right. And so, no, I, I love the Philly fans. Yeah. Um, they get a bad rap, but it's, uh, you know, 
you obviously play on other teams and you know a lot of drunk assholes in philly which is every every state has yeah. that they oh, seem yeah. they seem to come out a little bit more uh they're more prevalent yeah at the eagles games but uh <laughs> having lived in philly i mean it's um so when i first well wait were you there was the link there uh, so I, I played in the last game in Veterans Stadium and the first game at the link. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So I, I played like right at that twilight. Yeah. And uh, I remember, you know, obviously, you know, California kid coming to Philly. I showed up. I thought it was Gotham City. Yeah. You know, it was like it could not have been farther away on the planet. Like if you picked anywhere other than like, you know, Siberia, Russia, it was yeah. as far away from anything I'd ever been in. Yeah. And, you know, that first year I kind of had this like, you know, everything. It's, uh, and then at some point I had this cultural mind shift where I was like, dude, this is amazing. Yeah. Like, this is so different. Like you need to embrace this. And yeah. once I embraced it, uh, I felt like, and even to this day, when I go back to Philly, uh, I joke that it's like uh, slipping on an old, old jacket that you found in your closet. You're like, <laughs> I put this thing on. <laughs> Here's 20 bucks in the pocket. What happened? How come yeah. I don't wear this jacket more often? Yeah. That's what Philly is. As soon as I get there, you know, like the driving and just the whole attitude and everything, like I love it. All right. I, well, I'm sure the Eagles fans appreciate that. Oh, dude, it was a uh, huge mistake I made. Yeah. Um, I got into oh, really? a yeah. I, I got traded to the the uh, Chiefs. Uh -huh. I got into a contract dispute with uh, Andy Reid uh -huh. and uh, said some shit I probably shouldn't have. I was yeah. young and stupid yeah. and uh, ended up getting traded. And it was a stupid mistake. I should yeah. have played there for as long as I could. Uh, and I love playing in Kansas City, yeah. but um, what we had in Philly, and more importantly, like the Philly, just like the grid of Philadelphia, yeah. Yeah. I loved it. And uh, I, you know, as a kid from California, I never felt more at home and more accepted by a group of people than I yeah. did in uh, in Philadelphia. Well, maybe Andrew Reed was trading you there because he knew he was going to be there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I'll see him one day and we'll, we'll hug. But uh, dude, this was awesome, oh. man. I'm, I'm super excited to come check out your stuff. And uh, more importantly, uh, I got to do uh, one shameless plug. Oh, shameless plug. Go shameless. It's shameless. Um, so we have a, a book coming out. My, my partner and I wrote uh, Restore uh, the Life Changing Power of Right Away Wellness. Um, it is a lot of topics you cover on the show are, are covered in there. Um, I think it's told in a very playful way. Uh, we, we highlight when there is science, when there is lack of science and um, on a number of these areas. It is not just stuff that happens in the Restore locations. It is an entirely holistic way of thinking about health. You'd be proud of it. Hopefully give, I have a copy here for you. I'm excited to read I, it. I think you'll enjoy it. Um, and anybody that's looking to pre-order, you can order it at uh, restore.com. You'll find it there. And if um, if you live uh, near a restore location, please check it out. Um, we will help you get you on your journey to wellness. Um, no matter whether you're trying to you know have a personal record or overcome rheumatoid arthritis, we're there to help you. Awesome. Well, you heard it here first. All right. Thanks, John. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hey there, Power Athlete Nation. Big shout out to all the heavy hitters who stuck around till the final whistle. If you've been soaking in the knowledge bombs and epic tales you've been dropping for free, here's your chance to be a game changer. Swing by klfi.com slash power athlete and toss a few bucks our way to keep the podcast fueled and firing on all cylinders. That's ko-fi.com forward slash power athlete. Your support makes a difference. See ya.